All right, the special, special session of the Board of Education is now called to order. Roll call. Geiger. Meek. Here. Myers. Here. Thompson. Here. Williams. Here. Weiniger. Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and with that, we are moving into number four, the board consideration of selection of director to fill Board of Education Director District B vacancy. Um, as there was a tie between the two remaining nominees at the last meeting on January 23rd, and neither nominee received the majority of votes, after two additional rounds of voting, this matter was deemed table until the next meeting, which is this meeting. Since then, one of the nominees has withdrawn their candidacy and the February 10th deadline for the board to select a person to fill the vacancy has passed, meaning that as board president, I'm legally required to appoint someone to fill the vacancy. Procedurally, the specific matter of the board's consideration of making an appointment will die without a motion to make or to take the matter from the table, and I will proceed into making the appointment. So given that, informa given that information, is there a motion to take the matter from the table? If there is not a motion, we will just move into number five and the matter will die. So if there's not a motion, we will move forward, but if there is? Just right. point of information, because yeah. it, it sounds a little confusing. Yes. I just want to make sure yes. that I'm even understanding. Sure. So if no one makes a motion, we move into agenda item number five. That's is, correct. Is what I heard. Yeah. Okay. So it essentially, because it was tabled, and per our resolution, it just says that it was tabled until the next meeting. So procedurally, we either have to let it die by not making or not taking it off the table um, and then that's when we would move in. Otherwise, we could, as a board, have a discussion, not necessarily um, any action to be taken. It just seems like maybe it's less confusing to make a motion to table number four, or no? Just it's, it, was auto, it was already tabled, so it's been, it okay. was tabled after the three rounds of voting. So at this time, okay. uh, it's still that's tabled right. unless we take it off, and it will die if nobody takes it from the table. I know it's, it's very confusing. All right. All right. So then uh, we then, with no motion to take it off the table, we'll move into agenda item number five, which is the appointment of director to fill the Board of Education Director B. So in the event that the board does not make an appointment to fill the vacancy within the required 60-day period, Colorado law requires the board president to appoint a person to fill the vacancy. Since the 60 day period expired on February 10th, I must now make the appointment. So um, as I have sat up here over the last couple months, I see that all six of us that currently sit on the Board of Education have a very different and unique skill sets. We all bring a lot of different things to the table. And so when I think about um, a new member, it's that they can provide something different than any of what the six of us uh, provided. And considering there were only two finalists um, and one has taken their name uh, from the candidacy, um, I uh, am going to select uh, Mr. Moore, uh, Tim Moore, to fill the vacancy to Director District B, but just to kind of give a little bit of why, I think that Mr. Moore has been a, a leader in our community for over 30 years. He has served on many, many boards, including the Crisis Center Board and the Developmental Pathways, and I think that will definitely bring uh, a unique perspective when we are looking at important upcoming items that the board will be discussing. Um, Many people who have worked with Mr. Moore describe him as a person of integrity and honor, and I am excited to have him sit on the Board of Education with the six of us. So with that, we will do the oath of office as long as you accept the, uh, the appointment.
So then how do you, is that better? Stacy, like right here, okay. All right, so I'm gonna you raise your right hand. I, Timothy Moore, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully perform. I, Timothy Moore, do faithfully swear that I will perform. The duties of the office of school director. The duties of the office of school director. As required by law. As required by law. And will support the Constitution of the United States. And will support the Constitution of the United States. And the laws made pursuant thereto. And the laws made pursuant thereto. Thank you very much. All right, and with that, we will uh, move to adjournment until our uh, regular work session that will begin at 5 p.m. So I will take roll call on that. Or I'm sorry, do I have a motion to adjourn? A point of information yes. Yes. or inquiry, actually. I'm just wondering, since we're running so far ahead, if it might make sense just to talk about board liaison assignments because we won't have another meeting before we go into that uh, retreat and the second half of our retreat is dedicated to working with our committees and I believe we will break into the various committees where we'll work with them on looking at their bylaws looking at their priorities etc and I just wonder if we as a board might be better prepared if we actually just made the assignments it's two and a half months into the year now The notice for the special meeting was not called for purposes of engaging in that discussion. It was not noticed on the agenda. So I am concerned that without having it being duly noticed and the public informed of that being an agenda item for discussion at this special meeting, that it would not be appropriate for discussion at this time. Even if it's a information, uh, we're not voting on anything. It's a discussion. I, again, I'm concerned about transparency with the public and the fact that it wasn't posted for notice sure. at this time. Great. I'll, I'm happy they, to bring but, it up for a regular meeting. When... Great. So do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion by Weiniger, second by Myers. Myers. Geiger. Geiger. Aye. Meek. Aye. Aye. Moore. Aye. Myers. Aye. Thompson. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passes seven to zero. And it has been adjourned.
The meeting of the Board of Education is now called to order. Roll call. Geiger is excused. Meek? Here. Moore? Here. Myers? Here. Thompson? Here. Williams? Here. Weiniger? Here. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. One day I'm going to break out into my country too. Great, and on to the DCSD Spotlight celebrating career and technical education. Okay, thank you very much. So tonight's spotlight, instead of just being a video, we have live people to talk to us about um, career and technical education in our district and to help us celebrate um, Career and Technical Education Month. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Dan McMinimi and he can introduce his guests that are here to celebrate Career and Technical Education. Thank you. Here we go. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board. Thank you so much for having us here this evening to talk about some amazing programming we have in our district. I'm sure you're aware of career and tech education, um, but we want to share with you uh, some more information and give you a backdrop of the things that we're doing. So we always try to start with the, the Douglas County mission statement because we think it's very important. This promise that we've made to our community is to provide an educational foundation that allows each student to reach his or her individual potential. In every one of our classrooms, that's the goal that we're striving for. We also take a look at your board ends, and we think tonight you're going to see a live illustration of two of these for sure. Every student has an equitable opportunity to acquire the knowledge and skills that will ensure performance at his or her highest individual potential, and a diverse set of educational options are provided which enables students to pursue different post-secondary options, be it college, to the military, independent living, whatever their future is, we wanna make sure that our students, when they leave our district, are prepared to go do whatever it is they're gonna do at a high level. So to that end, I have brought some people with me to illustrate this. I'm gonna introduce uh, Ms. Amy Barker, our Director of Post-Secondary Readiness. She's gonna to talk to you about three things. Um, first of all, she's gonna share with you some information regarding our Rock Canyon program. Secondly, she's going to share with you some information about Ascent. And finally, she's gonna introduce her amazing team that helps us execute this. So with that, Amy Barker. Good evening and happy CTE month. So it is timely that we're here and it's February and we like to celebrate all the wonderful things that are happening in um, career and technical education. And I'm gonna kind of jump to my team first, if that's okay. Um, so we have the um, very exciting privilege to oversee this programming that is growing and, and kind of just exploding in our district and that has been around and yet we're kind of revisiting it and redefining what these opportunities create for students. So I'm gonna start off with our career and technical education specialist and that is Krista Tongren. And she works with all of our teachers and supports programs across the district. And then we have our concurrent enrollment specialist, that's Matt Chambliss, and he um, supports all of the students. We have about 5,500 students who are taking concurrent enrollment classes this semester in our schools. And we have our work-based learning specialist, and that is Kathy Frommer. And she creates opportunities for students to experience what is life gonna look like when I actually pursue this job, and is it meant for me? So some really exciting work that we get to be a part of, and um, I'm very happy to be um, supported by a great team. Make sure I have this correct. So um, we get to celebrate a program that has been doing wonderful things for um, some time. And I want to introduce the instructor, Alan Chapman, from Fire Science at Rock Canyon. And he is going to bring his students up. Um, I want to make sure that he gets their names correct. So you guys want to come on up? Well, thanks for having us here. Um, on a, this is a Gianna Chapman, no relation. We've, we've already established that and stuff. Uh, she is a current student, a senior in the program. And then we got Matt Jabalanski. He was here two, three years ago. He is a, now a Brighton firefighter, working as a Brighton firefighter and stuff. So these are our two students that are successful. Um, a little bit about the program. As you can see up there, that's a good picture. We, um, I'll just start off right now with uh, the relationships we've built with uh, actual fire departments. Um, we have a really strong relationship with South Metro Fire. Um, I know a lot of people there. I was an ex-Littleton firefighter, now part of South Metro Fire with their merger. 
and stuff. So we have a really strong relationship there with uh, South Metro Fire. We train with them once a month at least. Um, this trailer here, we've developed a relationship with Franktown Fire. Um, Franktown Fire owes us. This is a burn trailer. They actually bring this up to the school and leave it with us for a week. So we actually do live fire training in that trailer and stuff. It's all gas fire, so really safe as far as uh, it's not actual wood fire, so we can shut off. If there's any problems, we can shut it off real quick and stuff like that. So, but anyways, Franktown has been awesome bringing that and leaving it for a week. And they come, they bring guys out to run it for us and everything too. So um, we've developed a lot of good relationships with a lot of fire departments around here. They're really hiring, uh, wanting to hire our guys like Matt at Brighton. We've got several on Denver. We've put several in the uh, Denver cadet program. Um, I've got them at South Metro, Grand Junction, all over. They're getting hired all over. So it's been a real success for them. And it's a, it's a hard business to get hired in. I mean, back when I was trying to get on, it took me three years to get on fire department. It's not easy. So um, the program consists of three classes, all through Red Rocks. So they have an opportunity to get nine college credit hours out of my class. Um, it's basically fire academy, CPAP prep, which is their workouts. They have to take the physical agility tower agility test for the uh, fire department and then we have another one that they just added for us from Rock, uh, Red Rocks and that's a class to prepare them to take the oral board interviews, written exam, the entrance exams and a little bit about the culture of the fire service. So that's the three classes that they take for the whole year with me. So once they're in there, they're in there for the whole year. Um, set up a little different than the, uh, most classes because it's a three hour class. I've got one in the morning and one in the afternoon and stuff for three hours. Um, other than that, yeah, that's the pretty much the gist of the program stuff. It's been great. I've run it since 2017 by myself. Uh, George Piccone started it first. He was a retired Colorado Springs firefighter, and he did an excellent job setting it up and stuff. So, and I've just kind of built it every year. Um, we've been fortunate to have the uh, little guy there in the white helmet. Don't tell him I call him the little guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Joe Sabia, he's a volunteer. He's volunteered with us for the last two years, a parent volunteer. He is a retired New York firefighter, and he comes in and works with these guys with all the practicals and stuff and gives a pretty powerful speech. He was a responder to 9-11. Uh, yeah, he uh, arrived there about 10 minutes before the South Tower fell and stuff. So he, um, he gives them a pretty good, powerful speech about what he experienced there and stuff. So we've been real fortunate to have him with us too. So after that, you guys want to talk about a little bit about your, uh, let yeah, yeah sure. let them, let them talk a little bit. Go ahead, you can go for Come on. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gianna Chapman. Nice to meet you guys. Um, I feel like the fire science program has really helped a lot of students, not only with um, like academics, um, but also like in like characteristic standpoints. Um, as far as like morals and being ethical about things. Um, I know I've learned a lot from this class and I have learned a lot from Mr. Chapman um, and also Joe Sabia. He's doing a fantastic job. Um, and yeah, I really, I really enjoy the program. Um, it, it makes me wanna help people. Um, be a little bit more helpful to my community. It's, it's really cool. Um, I was never like that before. Um, throughout my high school career, I've just kind of, you know, been wanting to graduate and like, that's it. Um, but as far as this class goes, I would love to continue with this class, like, as long as I could. Um, I would love to come back to, like, talk to the other kids, like, after I graduate, too. I feel like it's really given me an opportunity to, like, actually do something that I feel is important. Um, and, yeah, I've, I feel like this class is really um, done a lot for a lot of kids. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Madge Blonsky. Um, I pretty much say all the time to everybody that I know that I owe like my entire life to this class. I grew up dreaming of being a firefighter. And then when somebody came to me one day, he's like, hey, you can go be basically a, be a firefighter in high school and you get to go in live burn trainings during a high school class. I was like, you have to sign me up for this. There's, <laughs> there's no other way. Um, every interview I've been in, every, I've mentioned this class and everybody has just wondered like where is this, how can we get students involved in this? And the going through the days of their PT and all of the trainings that they do, it is just like a career fire academy. Obviously the days are shorter based on the school, 
timing, but it is as close as you can get is literally being on the front line as I am now. And I relate it all. I still get dressed the same way when I get on a rig to go for a call that I did three years ago when I was in this high school class. So those skills are really transforming over. And I keep in touch with a couple of the other students that have been gone to Denver Fire and other fire departments, and they all do the same thing. And that's been a great stepping point for them and it's a really a jump up in interview process it's like you said it's a long process it took me two years and it's some of the processes for departments are six months seven months long in order to come in so young if you have that little hey I went to Rock Canyon all of those departments now are like whoa like that's a big step and they're helping um, a lot of younger individuals especially kids coming straight out of high school get jobs um, right off the bat. So I really owe a lot to the program and Mr. Chapman for doing so much and all of the connections that he's had. And I hope it's a program that runs for a very, very long time. So when they get all that gear on, they're about 75 pounds more of gear on them. Yeah. Yep. Um, if you guys would like to see it, just let me know. I can move forward with it. But yeah. Gear up. Yeah, bring it up. Yeah, bring it up. Yeah, bring it up. because the friends on the live stream mm -hmm. can't hear. Oh, okay. It's a very big positive to at least have time in that gear. That was a big thing for me going into Fire Academy is that gear after eight to 10 hours at a career academy, it gets hot and you are like, it's something most people can't take because it is a lot of weight on your shoulders. So being able to have time in that gear before going into um, a department training session is awesome for um, younger individuals and anybody because it is, it's, hard to be in there it's no easy task for sure so yeah it gets heated up I mean even when you're just sitting in it like you're just sweating and from all that heat on your body it gets trapped like uh all up in all up in there um we have there's about three layers to to the jacket and the pants um so you know gets a little toasty but nothing nothing anyone can't handle unless you can't handle it then <laughs> You're in trouble. Um, this is my firefighter hat, I guess. And um, yeah, we wear these little emblems on it. They say Fire Science uh, RCHS for Rock Canyon. Um, and we get our little names on them. And then we're able to put little stickers on the back for our nicknames or whatever, whatever they give you as your nickname. Um, I've yet to get one. And I hope it stays that way. Um, <laughs> Um, but the, yeah, they're good things. Yes. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, um, and then these have little shoulder straps that come all the way up. Um, and yeah, whenever we go to tower days is what we call them with the um, actual crews. Um, they're wearing basically the exact same thing as us, just a few more accessories, like really a part of it. And um, yeah, it shows you what, what you can and cannot endure, for sure. Um, this class is not for quitters. <laughs> you got to have a stiff upper lip, for sure. How about the live fire day? Oh, yeah, the live fire days. Um, we did the uh, South Metro burn. Yes, we went up to a tower day, and uh, we were doing it with South Metro. I love the South Metro guys. They're so wonderful, and they treat us so well. Um, yeah, we did a live fire with them. We did uh, wood, and we had to wear our whole 
mask and SCBA, everything. Um, yeah, it got real hot in there. Uh, I think the hottest was like 500 degrees, something like that. Um, yeah, and I was kneeling on the ground, and I could feel the, the heat coming up through my uh, pants, but it only got a little red, and that was it. Um, so, no, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, um, they're definitely – it's it's more about safety than – anything. Um, we definitely have uh, quite a bit of fun um, in between like whatever we're doing. Um, it's definitely a community within the class. It's very nice. We're very tight-knit. Um, even with the kids that don't like each other, you know, everyone always gets, <laughs> uh, everyone's always snappy, gets all. their stuff done, you know. Um, but yeah, um, the live fire was really, really cool. Um, they showed us fire behaviors, which we also have to learn about within the class, but it's much, it's, I wouldn't say it's easier to see, like, see it in front of your face, but um, just because it's a little bit scary. But um, um, yeah, we, they teach us a lot. It's very nice. Um, even like stuff that we've like already learned in class, they'll like re-teach us almost. But they'll always show us like little tips and tricks, and you know, um, it's it's really nice. I mean, yeah, I don't really have yeah. much else to say. So one thing she did say there too, and what's really cool about teaching this program, as she mentioned, these are kids coming from all over Douglas County high schools and Littleton Public Schools. And uh, as an instructor, what's cool is to watch these guys come together. The first two weeks, I absolutely can't stand it because they're all. <laughs> They're just sitting there, you know, all quiet. Nobody knows really each other and stuff. But after about two weeks, they're like best friends. For the, and I've seen it mm. from academy to academy. They stay in touch after they're gone and stuff, mm -hmm. and they're all best friends, all coming from different places and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we've had a, uh, just kind of a little fun note, we've had a string of couples meeting in my class. <laughs> I've got two that have met in my class and are married now. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, kind of crazy, yeah. It's just a, I don't know what it is. Don't put that in the course guide. <laughs> don't put that, yeah, yeah. You know, we got a date. We got a dating service there too. Yeah, it's a dating service. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, it's it's really cool to. I know for me at least, like you go the next day and you're sitting in English class and math, but you're like, I'm a high school senior or junior and I was sitting in a simulated structure fire yesterday with real fire. There's nothing that gets any cooler than that. It, I'm a total fire nerd. That's all I've ever done. It's all I ever love. But it is, it's a great opportunity for sure. And I loved it. I stay in touch with all the people that were still in my class and just amazing. Any questions or anything we can Director answer? Director Myers has one. I do. I have a question. Well, first of all, thank you. Congratulations. Way to go. This is really, truly awesome. So what piqued your interest in this to get involved in? this career? Um, I don't have anything in my cards. At okay. All. Um, and I was looking for something that could have helped like in a career or gotten me college credit. To be honest, I didn't sign up for this class for all this. Um, but when I got to the class, it was a, a joy like to be in there. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't really have any, any like further ideas of like what the class was other than what my counselor told me. Um, she was, it, she made it seem like it was more of like a fire science class, you know, you like, you like light stuff on fire, you know, you, you, learn about, you learn about fire behavior, you know. I thought it was going to be more of like a chemistry class, but it was far from that when I got there. Um, but it's definitely, um, I don't know. So I can't resist this. When you slide down the pole and your feet go in the boots, then you pull up and you have to milliseconds to put everything on? Um, well, we have a minute and 30 seconds to put it on, but no. I usually am short of that, cause, which is mm -hmm. a good thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we don't have like a pole in there. Um, and I think, I think most stations are doing away with poles just because of the uh, safety. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a class that piqued my interest once I was there. Um, and I think, I think uh, I'm, I'm probably going to go into the fire service like in the future. Um, and hopefully it works out. I'm crossing my fingers, crossing my toes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Good job. Yeah, it's really, it's really a great class.
Yes. Yeah. You betcha. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. So they are definitely the stars of the show, and it's so um, exciting to get to be able to talk about and highlight the things that are happening in these programs and how, as she mentioned, people find their way to the path that they're meant to um, pursue. And I think that's exciting to find out that, you know, that's where you landed. So um, to kind of highlight, I hate to follow up behind this great, <laughs> you know, um, sharing of, of where they landed and how they're getting there, but I do want to kind of highlight an opportunity that... Thinking about the fire science program, and as uh, Mr. Chapman mentioned, that they can earn nine college credits. Uh, we also have an EMT program that is at Rock, Rock Canyon High School. We also have one at Legacy Campus. And they can um, enter an EMT program, pursue it for a year, and they can walk out with, I think I have it correct, 12 credits there. And so if a student can take the fire science program, which he mentioned he has some juniors that are accessing that, then go into an EMT program, they're that much further ahead, they've got that competitive advantage to pursuing that pathway. And then you think about the opportunity that a student might have through the ASCENT program. So the ASCENT program is a fifth year student program that is set up by state legislation and it allows the student, they, they've met graduation requirements, they have some eligibility requirements. They want to have nine post-secondary credit hours on their transcript. So if they've taken a concurrent enrollment English class or math class and any of these programs, they can qualify. They, they um, submit their application in the spring, and then they can pursue another year of college in a pathway that they are interested in. And we receive the PPR as the Douglas County School District, and we pay their tuition. So between these programs, you're looking at three years potentially for a student to go pursue a pathway, get college credits, and be that much further to the career of interest tuition free. So we've saved them time, we've saved them money, and those two precious commodities that we're all really trying to hope, you know, that we can conserve. So I just wanted to highlight that in the opportunities that are available in the fire science program. I did a little research also before I got here. Red Rocks offers in a partnership, um, if you have your AAS, that you can continue on to get a bachelor's with Regis. So these students could really set themselves up to have that progression of where they want to head into the industry and um, walk out without tuition and saving a little bit of time. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. McCormick. So thank you. So a few final thoughts for you here. Um, first of all, you can see why it is so amazing to work in this district when you take a great instructor and you put them in a positive situation with the finances to make a program happen for students. You can see that passion and heard that in the, both the student and the person that is in the industry right now. And that's what we're trying to replicate in all of our CTE programs is really give kids real life, real life experiences that they can take away and say, hey, I've done that before and I've been successful and therefore I can do this in my future. Um, I'm going to share with you a slide in a moment about the course request process that we talked about the last time I was here. We wanted to integrate it into Infinite Campus um, to make sure that we're providing access to all of our students across the district to all of our programs. Um, that, coupled with the common schedule, has allowed us to have a lot of students that are very interested in these programs now because they have the means to get into the class and they have the great opportunities. Um, next year's program expansion plans include all of the year two programs at our legacy campus. And then finally, regional, state, and national competitions, all of those dates are coming up. And if you'd like to participate in that, we've uh, put a full list in there. The other thing I would say is if you ever want to go on a really cool field trip, find out when the Rock Canyon Fire students go out and do one of the, the live fire events, or if they go do the ice rescue at one of the ponds on Highlands Ranch. Those are really cool events. So this is a, a screenshot of the course request process that we put into Infinite Campus. Um, what you see here on the far left is a course, and we have in this database every single course that's either an ACC course, a Metro State course, a Red Rocks course, a Career and Tech Ed course, or a concurrent enrollment course. Um, and then we had students have an opportunity in their school to pull that into their requests for next year. So if I was sitting at Thunder Ridge, I pulled these out of the district master calendar or master course request process, and I can make a request sitting at Thunder Ridge to go to a program at Legacy. Um, this is a, a huge improvement over what we've done in the past. 
Down the middle, I greened it out because it was obviously student names, um, but you can see the grade and the enrollment status with them. We also put, um, we have their email address so that the school that they want to go to can reach out. What I really want to direct your attention to are those multicolored uh, circles on the right-hand side. This was pulled last week. We had 39,762 requests for a seat and a course at one of our campuses or at one of our programs at another campus. So that's not an individual student. We don't have 39,000 high school students. We wouldn't have enough space. What it does represent is a student wanting a course. And so some of our pathways are multiple courses in one section. So aviation science is really four classes at Metro State. So that would count against that four. But you can see the patterns from our high schools, and they're going to go this next week and clean those up. The following week, we're going to start the process of sending emails out and saying, hey, congratulations. We saw that you're interested in this program. Would you put in an application for it so that we can get kids into these classes? But we're going to continue to try to refine this database. The other pieces we're trying to pay attention to is demographic information and male-female information. We think that's going to be really important that we try to balance that as much as possible as we're putting kids into these programs. So finally, there's some resources for you here. All of these are hot links to the CTE course guide that we uh, put together again this year, Legacy Campus website, um, some CTE videos, a live action of our students in their career and tech ed programming, um, career and, t and technical student organization competitions. If you're interested in going to any of those, you can contact Amy and she can make sure that you have the particulars. Ascent information session, if you're interested in hearing more about that, we're doing that on March 7th at the Legacy Campus. And then finally, we have an updated post-secondary readiness website. Are there any questions that we can answer for you? Director Meek. I can always ask questions on this topic. I love right. this topic. Um, I'm just curious if we are reaching into the middle school level to talk about some of these programs and opportunities to help build that pipeline. So that is still in progress. Um, when I was here before, we had a really robust ICAP process and in using uh, information that students would um, find out what they were interested in. We're still doing the career fair. That's one vehicle. But we're in process of trying to work with the middle schools about how we can build that excitement. Um, we are also going to start doing some camps at the Legacy Campus during the summer that are focused on specific things like robotics, that type of thing. I, I can also add, we also have all of our counselors still, <clears throat> they actually go to our middle schools as well to talk about course registration, pathway-based opportunities for our students. And so that happens with multiple counselors, individual schools, with every single eighth grader that heads off, is they will meet with them to review their course guide with them as well. So then in addition to the middle school um, at the high school level, how do we help make um, other students aware of all the opportunities that are out there. I know when Legacy first opened and we heard from students, a lot of students felt like they had no idea. And so it's been a couple of years now and I'm just curious what um, opportunities are out there to make sure all of our students are aware of these opportunities. Yeah, so we, we've tried to do a lot of outreach with the high school counselors and have them have the information that they can share with students. Um, I know Katie and Rex have done programming where they've gone to individual high schools and talked with students or groups of students and make the adults aware of what we're going on. Um, you saw the CTE course guide that we put out there that is illustrative of all the programs we do across our district. And in Legacy has a really nice website that students can have access to. Um, we do that night where we have the Legacy Campus Night where we have people coming in. I think there was probably close to 500 people that were there this week. Over 1,000 people. So. Um, <laughs> You know, and I, the other thing I think is happening, too, is just word of mouth in our community about the amazing opportunities we have. So we're trying to seize as many chances as we can to try to illustrate what we're doing. But I know word of mouth is going to be the biggest thing about getting kids to those programs and getting them to other high schools for programs. When you talk about the welding program, the um, uh, Pro Start program, the Auto Tech programs that we have, we have a lot of great programs all across our district for students. If I could also add, um, I think the massive change in demand is also um, an indicator that more and more students and their families know that these pathways are available to them even if they are not in their home high school. Um, and that has very much been a focus of Dan's, uh, Dan's team is to make sure that we 
kind of brought all these disparate pieces together into um, a single comprehensive catalog so that all of our um, students and families across the district understand what's available. Um, and that the current, the current technical education night at Legacy Campus was a fantastic success. Something we are working on though um, is making, and, and uh, Amy touched on it tonight, is making the Ascent program more well known because that is an incredible, incredible opportunity for our kids. And while the demand for it has increased somewhat, we want to continue to make sure that families know that that's even an option. We actually had over 300 students that indicated initial interest in the ascent program for next year. That's over. It was, we had 50 this year that are participating in it. So we think that's going to take off. And you can see it's not that big of a leap to say, I'm in this program out of high school and I want to go ahead and pursue that in college. So I'm going to go ahead and have that year taken care of. What are the biggest adjustments that has helped unintentionally slash intentionally was actually around the coordinated bell schedule to talk about pathways? that really changed the conversation around structurally a shift that we did about creating access. And I think our numbers, which from our previous meeting in, in November showed upwards of a thousand more students having access to pathway-based programming across the system. So that schedule has really helped create some demand by saying when I think about the opportunities, not only what's in front of me at my school, but what's in front of me across our nine schools. So I think one thing that's going to be great about that database is that's going to allow us to see where the patterns are where kids are requesting programs because we've removed some of the barriers and now we can see that there's 120 students that want year one aviation. So how do we respond as a district? Do we create another program? Do we add FTE to the legacy campus? Um, and you can see those patterns all across our district in cosmetology, in ProStart, in auto tech. We know where kids want to have the programming now. The challenge this next year is going to be that we don't have enough seats in some of those areas. I told you I can keep asking questions. Um, something that I always am interested in learning more about is the demand for CTE programming for our students with special needs. And are we tracking what that demand looks like and what offerings that we can um, provide to our community? So that will be part of the database when we get those names of students that are requesting programming. We can slice it and dice it however we want to see what types of students are requesting what types of programs. But that would only be for existing programs, right? At this point, yes. Right. So I guess I'm just curious if there's a demand. I know we've talked about it for many years. Um, students with autism and CTE programming options that might be available. So I'm just curious where, where we might be on that front. We, we certainly are aware that there is a demand, um, and that was, as you know, part of the phase two for Legacy Campus. So um, we have to be able to get that uh, phase two, um, that phase two construction done for Legacy Campus um, in order to be able to start those programs. Thank you. And that was in direct alignment to visiting like TACT and some other programs as well to start talking about pathway program that we can offer here, which we're still creating access within our current high schools already. So when we look at programming currently right now, um, I don't think we are saying we're ex there's our odd students with autism are being excluded from programming. We currently are providing those opportunities at the scale we're able to within our current structure at this point in time, but we're actually actively monitoring the data around accessibility and our data right now talking about accessibility and representation of our school district. There really is an alignment with, with what our school district looks like with those that are accessing program as well too. <laughs> so I knew that was something that was in the bond package last time and I I know we're going to be talking about potential polling, and so I think it could be a really interesting area to ask what the demand is like in our communities around certain programming. And I just know special ed programming is something that I've heard from many community members is, is really desired. Thank you guys thank so you. much. I, I feel the passion, so thank you very much for being here, everyone. It's very exciting. Did you, did you want to ask one real fast? Are you sure? All right. Um, superintendent reports. 
Okay, um, thank you. I have uh, a rather long list tonight, so I will try to stay in my 10 minute allotment. Um, DCSD is hoping, hosting a job fair to recruit licensed staff at the Legacy Campus on the evening of Friday, February 23rd. Um, this is open to internal DCST and external teacher and special education candidates. It is the place to be, so um, hopefully we can get as many people there as possible. We are advertising it far and wide. There is a lot to celebrate in February, and I won't be able to touch on all of them, um, but I can do some highlights. February is Black History Month. Douglas County School District is proud to join our community and the nation in celebrating the history of African Americans and recognizing the contributions of Black Americans throughout our nation's history. The theme of 2024 Black History Month is African Americans and the arts. We are really looking forward to hearing about the lessons and activities taking place in our schools over the course of the month. February is also American Heart Month. So today was Go Red Day for staff at DCSD. Thus, all the red that you may see in the room, um, we are wearing red in support of heart health. Um, as you heard during our spotlight, February is also career and technical education. Um, we can, we are incredibly proud of all that we were able to offer our high school students and we're really excited for the future. February 5th through 9th was National Counseling Week and we celebrated our counselors on DCSD social media channels and on the district website, including a couple of spotlight stories. So be sure to check those out. We are incredibly grateful to our counselors. They have been a game changer for our district and the work that they do is amazing and necessary and we're very thankful for them. February 15th is National School Resource Officer Appreciation Day. So we really want to send our appreciation to all of our school re resource officers, including future school resource officers. Um, we are just really, really thankful for our partnership with um, our law enforcement partners at the Douglas County Sheriff's Office, Lone Tree Police Department, Castle Rock Police Department, and the Parker Police Department. Um, our SROs have been amazing in our schools, and we are just incredibly appreciative of all that they do. National Public Schools Week is coming up February 26th through March 1st. Our annual Girls and Women in Sports Luncheon is taking place this Friday, February 16th. It's always an incredible event. Thank you to those of you who will be there. The Douglas County Special Education Advisory Committee, DCCAC, is accepting nominations for its Shining Star Awards. Shining Stars are DCSD staff members and schools nominated for outstanding service by parents and or caregivers of students receiving special education services. Be sure to nominate your Shining Star by Thursday, February 29th at www.dccac.org. Next Wednesday, February 21st at 10 a.m., in the Wilcox boardroom, our special education directors will be hosting a coffee talk. Family engagement talks are hosted monthly by the special education department and provide parents and families with relevant information regarding services and supports in the district community. The special education page on the DCSD website has more information about the topics covered during the monthly family engagement talks, um, as well as where to RSVP for next week's opportunity. Students from 57 elementary, middle, and charter schools participated in Douglas County School District's annual Spelling Bee on Saturday, February 3rd, despite the snow, at the Legacy Campus. The top 25 students will be moving to the state Spelling Bee, including Rebecca Jarrison, a student at Challenge to Excellence Charter School who took first place at the district Spelling Bee. Graham Clark, a student from Ranchview Middle School who took second place, and Sai Sharia Reddy, a student at World Compass Academy who took third place. These 25 students will take an online test on February 22nd and the top 15 to 20 spellers in the state will advance to the in-person portion of the competition at the University of Denver on March 9th. Mountain Ridge Middle School teacher Jennifer Caccino has volunteered with the Spelling Bee for more than 20 years. This was her final Spelling Bee of pronouncer. She will be retiring at the end of this year. Thank you, Jennifer, for your service. 27 students from Douglas County School District's Eagle Academy are making their artistic debut 
through Call from the Erie, a, an Eagle Academy art show, a 2024 Winter Commissioner's Choice exhibition at the Lone Tree Arts Center. And I know some of you went to opening night, as did I, and it was fantastic. Eagle Academy art teachers, uh, Rob Ricks, presented the idea to the Lone Tree Arts Commission, and they approved the show. These students worked through winter break to finish their art in times for the opening recession opening reception on January 25th. Um, please check out the free exhibit. It runs all the way through March 24th in the Lone Tree Arts Center, which is open from 10 to 4, Monday through Friday. On March 27th, we are hosting an information meeting about the Ascent program, as previously mentioned, at the Legacy Campus. The Accelerating Students Through Concurrent Enrollment Program is a fifth year high school program that allows students to participate in concurrent enrollment um, the year after 12th grade, enroll in post-secondary courses and earn college credit at no tuition cost to them and their families. CHASA's Student Leadership Summit is being hosted this weekend at Douglas County High School. This summit gives all the students in, atten in attendance the opportunity to share projects and program ideas with other Colorado student leaders. Our Girls Swim and Dive Championship was last weekend at Castleview High School. Um, Castleview High School's Myla Nikarov won the 500 freestyle with a time of just 4 minutes 42 seconds. Um, it was just 1 minute and 2 seconds off of the state, excuse me, I think that is 1 second, 1 second and 2 milliseconds off the state record um, championship by Missy Franklin set in 2013. So we have the next, next Missy Franklin in our midst. Um, state wrestling is happening this weekend. We have 36 student athletes um, vying for the state title. Former Thunder Ridge High School basketball star Abby Warner Botella was in, indicted in, in inducted. Ooh, inducted into the Chassa Hall of Fame. Um, Abby read Thunder Ridge to three Class 5A championships and was a National Girls High School back Basketball Player of the Year, two-time Miss Colorado basketball winner, and is Colorado's second-ranked scorer of all time. She's also been an inspirational speaker at our Girls and Women's in Sports luncheon, and she is just an incredible role model for our kids. Um, for the first time in history, in school history, three Rock Canyon High School teams took the 5A title championships. It was a first time win for boys cross country, golf, and a six state championship win for the Rock Canyon Palms. Thunder Ridge seniors, Jackson Remick and Gavin um, Harmon, um, sorry, signed to play division one cornhole at Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Rock Hill is the hub for the American Cornhole League, where the duo will play professionally for the Colorado Timber. Um, our cabinet team attended and cheered on the Rock Canyon High School Unified Team at their annual inclusion game um, in front of a packed and rowdy gym full of fans. It was so amazing to see all the kids cheering uh, each other on and just to see their faces. And I have to tell you, those kids um, sunk basketballs far more easily than I ever could. Um, I don't know how many tries you would have to give me for me to get a basketball in. So they were really amazing. Um, the kids were amazing and uh, the audience was amazing and it was a lot of fun. Rob Johnson, our athletic director at Chaparral was just named the 5A athletic director of the year by Colorado Athletic Director Association. Um, not for our league, but for the entire state. So we will be recognizing Rob at a future board meeting. Um, I only have a few left, I promise. This is a big month. Wish weeks are happening or have happened across many of our high schools and feeders. Assemblies, movie nights, dances, sporting events, and a full array of incredibly unique and fun events have been purposely planned to bring entire feeder areas together for a common cause of um, granting a child their wish. This past weekend, I had the privilege of attending the elementary honor school um, honor choir performance and the middle school honor ensemble concerts. Both were absolutely incredible. We have some talented, talented students in our district. Congratulations to the students that were selected to perform and to our educators, our music educators that made it possible. Clear Sky Elementary singers were recently selected to sing at the Air Force Academy's men's basketball game. So that is an incredible honor. 
And congratulations to Pioneer Elementary School's STEAM teacher, Susan Irwin, for receiving the 2024 Outstanding Teacher Award from the Colorado Arch uh, Agriculture in the Classroom. This prestigious award recognizes her exceptional efforts in integrating agriculture into her classroom curriculum, fostering agriculture literacy, and inspiring students to become conscientious contributors to a sustainable global society. We will be honoring her at a future board meeting as well. Last one. Many of our high school seniors participated in the National Letter of Intent Signing Day, meaning they have committed to being part of a, t a sporting team at the college of their choice. Congratulations to these students and best wishes for their futures. Thank you very much. That concludes superintendent updates. Thank you. On to item number six, 2425 enrollment projections. It will be a 20 minute presentation followed by a 10 minute Q&A. Chief Operating Officer Rich Cosgrove will be kicking off this presentation. Good evening, directors. Good evening, directors. Every year, our planning department and consultant release enrollment projections, which are the basis for analyses of school capacities and site-based budgets. The accuracy is truly amazing. There are national factors that are impacting the variances at schools. And with me tonight, we have our planning manager, Siobhan Caldwell, our planning specialist, Chris Meehan, and our consultant, Shannon Bingham, with Western Demographics, who will present our annual enrollment projections. Hello, directors. Good evening. Um, so Shannon and I from WDI are going to co-give this presentation. And thank you to the directors who have already seen this presentation, I think, three times now for <laughs> hanging in there with us. So um, as Rich said, I'm the manager in the planning department. Um, one of our tasks that we're responsible for is developing and distributing uh, enrollment forecast every December for the next five years. Um, so before we jump into the forecast themselves, I just want to briefly touch on two questions that we always get when presenting this data, um, and that is how accurate really are these? And then also, where are we this year in comparison to last year and also just kind of recent history? Um, so in terms of accuracy, uh, overall, we are very accurate. Uh, what you're looking at is what was projected and released in December of 2022 for the following 2023-24 school year in comparison to the 2023 pupil count. So for all students K-12, we over projected by 14 kiddos. So we're 0.02% um, accurate uh, compared to this year's count. Uh, the next two tables just break that out by charter school enrollment versus DCSD operated schools enrollment. Um, that's really for enrollment projections purposes. We get projections directly from charters and typically do not adjust them unless needed. <laughs> so we typically take those at face value. So this bottom um, table showing DCSD administered operated enrollment is a probably more accurate reflection of our um, our models uh, accuracy. Do you have anything to add to that, Shannon? Nope. Okay. Uh, and then this, oops, going, getting ahead of myself. Back, 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 back. Sorry about that. Uh, so this table just shows uh, DCSD operated schools enrollment broken down by the different types of programs. Um, you could see that for neighborhood schools, we slightly over projected by about 1.3%. Um, at magnet schools, we over projected by 37 students. That's a much smaller population, so that 4.92% looks a little bit more drastic than it is. Um, for alternative education, so this would include DC Oaks, Eagle Academy, and Vail, we did miss incorporating Vail into last year's projections. We got that incorporated this year, so that's those 58 kids that you're seeing missing there. And then for on online and homeschool programs, which would be Cloverleaf and EDCSD, we were we underprojected six kids. <clears throat> and then these next few slides are just going to show what we were what that second question: Where are we this year in comparison to previous years? 
Um, so this table, what you're seeing here on the left side, you're seeing totals for the 2021, 2022, and 2023 CDE count. Um, and then that's broken down by district operated and charter operated. Um, and then the district operated is broken down by those different programs that you saw on the previous slides. And then charter schools are broken down by um, in-facility charter enrollment and then HOPE Online. Just because HOPE Online is not really reflective of what's happening within the DCSD service area. About 97% of their enrollment is outside of Douglas County and Elbert County. Um, so you can see that we are down 908 pupils this year in comparison to last year's count. That's very similar to what we saw last year where we were down 1,004 pupils compared to the previous year's count. Um, and the majority of that decline in enrollment that we're seeing is in our uh, district neighborhood schools and then in the HOPE Online um, charter school program enrollment. And then this table is intended just to show what is happening in our neighborhood schools by level. Um, it's in the same format as the previous table. Um, you'll see that the totals or the deltas are expressed as an absolute or um, percent change. Um, so what this shows us is that at the elementary level, we were really flat last year. We had the same exact enrollment in 2022 as we did in 2021. Um, we are down 0.82% this year in comparison to last year's count. And then about 3% at the middle school level and 2% at the high school level. So you'll see a trend where very, what's happening this year, what happened this year in comparison to last year's count, very similar to what we saw last year in comparison to the 2021 count. <clears throat> and then this table just gives a little bit better picture of what's happening by level uh, district-wide. So inclu it includes all district enrollment except for HOPE Online enrollment. Um, it's a little bit less drastic when you look at this across all schools and pro programs. You see that we're pretty flat, which is a very slight decline in our elementary levels. And then um, we saw a decline much closer to about 1.5% um, in our middle school and high school levels. And then this one gives a, a picture of what's happening geographically. So across our district by feeder and by planning area. Um, I think this shows really well the pockets of growth that are occurring within the district. Um, within a planning area, you kind of have a difficult time seeing those trends that are occurring. Um, so if you look at the east planning area, which is our Parker area of the district, um, you'll see some pretty significant growth in the Ponderosa High School feeder. That's all that development that's occurring along the Crowfoot Valley Road corridor. Um, and then in the north planning area, you'll see that overall as a planning area, we are declining by about 2.36%. But you can see those bookends of growth that you've seen in pre previous presentations where we have uh, Sterling Ranch and the canyons are kind of tempering that, that decline that we're seeing in the um, Mountain Vista and the Highlands Ranch feeder. Um, and I did think it was worth pointing out, so the Thunder Ridge feeder, you'll see that that looks like a very flat number, that we're not experiencing any growth. And one would say, what about Sterling Ranch and Solstice? What's happening there? Um, so you'll see that little footnote that a total of 596 of these students are what would be 10% of all of Thunder Ridge feeders enrollment is coming from Solstice and Sterling Ranch. So that flat number and that one number is pretty much what's happening in Sterling Ranch, <laughs> tempering the decline that you're seeing in the older um, neighborhoods in West Highlands Ranch. Do you have anything to add to that? I'm actually go back to that slide for a second. Okay. Is this mic live? I guess I am live. Um, so well, good evening, everybody. It's a privilege to be here. Um, so just as you look at this, you can kind of see around the district uh, a couple of different things happening. In uh, October of 2022, we had a dramatic change in interest rates that pulled us from sub-4% interest rates up to 65 And over the next calendar year, we went all the way up to about 85 and have come down to about 75 And this has had a really profound impact on young families' ability to get into new housing and a lot of... Um, what has kept a Douglas County School District on a growth uh, platform for a long time has been housing growth. 
All around the country, demographers have been scrambling for the last three years to cope with two things, the changing interest rate situation and its effect on young families, and simultaneously some generational changes where we're seeing the leading edge of some significant behavioral changes on the part of millennial and Generation Z age young adults regarding their choices for uh, family size. So all over the West, every state that I work in from here to Alaska is looking at a rather dramatic declining birth count and birth rate. And so that is affecting us rather significantly. And in the areas on this table where we don't have significant amounts of new housing helping us fill that leaky bucket, if you will, of fewer uh, children coming from young families, um, we are seeing enrollment declines. And the other thing that uh, creates a disadvantage for us is a lot of our housing is higher value housing. So um, when we saw the interest rate um, impact, a lot of our housing was priced in a manner where young families were just priced out of the market. And so that had some rather dramatic and rather immediate effects on us because it created a situation where young families just stopped locating. And a lot of the housing that we see with certificates of occupancy during the last 18 months really demonstrate that we're looking at a little bit of a different game, at least temporarily, until interest rates normalize. Some parts of the district are older. So for example, Legend is predominantly um, housing that might be a little bit older, even though it's been built during my career. But uh, the Pinery was a school, uh, uh, an attendance area or a development where we were building schools very rapidly. And now that housing is some of our lower yield housing. So that's an example of that generation of housing that is producing fewer students, although a lot of those Homes have kids in our high schools, in Legend and Shap and else, elsewhere. And then you think of another community like the um, oh, Castle View feeder area, where a lot of that housing in the meadows was built probably between 2004 and about 2014. And now that housing is starting to produce fewer children as well. So we're seeing these kind of fluctuations. And obviously, in the North Planning area, we have uh, very stable neighborhoods in Highlands Ranch, Mountain Vista, and Rock Canyon feeders. Thunder Ridge is growing rapidly, but Thunder Ridge is seeing quite a bit of that generational impact, where a lot of that housing is priced in a category where um, young families faced with interest rate challenges that may add $1,000 a month to a house payment are basically being um, excluded from the market. So until that turns around, and I'm really hoping that it will, we're going to see some of these impacts around the district. This was a very high risk forecast. Um, a lot of my colleagues around the country, especially those who have fixed software models for their forecasting, are scrambling and are dealing with a lot of egg on face because their models were embedded in software and ours is a little bit more fluid and involves a lot of conversation and a lot of conferencing um, with our leadership teams at all levels to make sure we're doing the right thing. And so that's a big reason why we were a little bit more accurate than some of our uh, peers. On this next slide, you can see um, our, our, my, my methodology there, which is basically what's called cohort survival. I backwards reconciled to an overall control total for the district because big sample sizes produce accurate results. I'm very, very birth rate centric. So we get attendance area, elementary attendance area level data from Kirk at the Colorado Department of Health. And we are watching every one of these attendance areas and trying to be a little less focused on housing growth and a little more focused on birth rates to kind of acknowledge what the young families in those attendance areas are actually doing in the way of planning families and how that will affect us in the future. So a lot of in-out migration. We monitor housing yield, housing price. So we're looking at our big voids where we have a 10 square mile area with no facility in those and we're looking at relative um, house prices and uh, growth rates in those areas and still seeing profound needs all over the district. 
But because of the expanse of our geography, when we have these 10 square mile areas with no schools, um, there's a real level of service issue there for those families and we try to be really on top of that and um, make sure that we continue to maintain good data. Um, Charter schools, our, our, uh, our uh, charter partners tend to um, uh, enroll their schools fully and, and draw from uh, a wait list when they need to. And so for the most part, our, our charter forecasting tends to be uh, more stable going into the future. And that's very consistent with other districts that higher, have relatively high charter percentages like uh, district 49 down in El Paso County also has a similar situation. Other big districts that I work with that have a large percentages of, ch of uh, schools in the charter governance model also behave just like we do. So um, very similar there. Uh, we have anticipated the new uh, Lehman campus and have been looking at the sub-regional effects in the um, um, uh, that general area, the, the Meadow Arc area, the Cielo area, um, that whole um, uh, corridor there and the effects on the uh, neighborhood and the other charter schools with that new school activation. So um, we're trying to um, keep an eye on that Crowfoot Valley area very carefully. Um, let's see. Um, this just shows my expectation for the next... Uh, Oh, I guess that would be the next five years, which is what I'm comfortable with at this point. I think we're going to continue to build houses like crazy. Um, right now we are at one third of our volume housing wise from 18 months ago when interest rates were in a different place. I still believe that between now and June, there will be continuing moderation of the interest rate situation. I think it has to be that way. Um, we are changing the behaviors of a whole generation of young people through these interest rates right now. The amount of children or young adults that are being driven into apartment living and are making decisions about their future family lives right now is um, very troubling. And the interest rate situation uh, is really, I think, at the core of that as we interview a lot of young adults who are scratching their heads about having families right now, housing cost, cost of living, but more than anything, housing cost is really what seems to be changing behavior in a lot of cases. Uh, let's see. Um, next slide, we'll just keep watch, uh, marching along. Um, this just shows by planning area, what are our expectations? Again, because of that Crowfoot Valley corridor, um, the developments that are down in the uh, Ponderosa area, we're expecting um, quite a bit of uh, growth in that east area that might offset some of our generational decline. That's also some of our more affordable housing. So we're seeing young families a little bit more able to find opportunities in that area because those uh, developers and builders uh, were offering um, more affordable product. And so that has been more interest rate proof than other uh, property where we are looking at higher house values. Um, let's see. Um, I think I wanted to point out too that this slide, just to remember that this is synthesized at a very large regional scale. So the, again, this does not show well those pockets of growth that we're um, working to address and provide seats for and incorporate in our capital planning, that you do still have you know, these uh, areas that are growing, um, you know, not an insubstantial amount of growth like Sterling Ranch and the canyons and um, other areas that are declining when you look at, at a large region. But I just wanted to keep pointing that out that we will be bringing <laughs> solutions and, and alternatives for these, these, um, these areas of growth where we're needing solutions moving forward still. Um, so this is just basically, again, looking at the next five years and what we're expecting by level. We're looking at um, holding steady at the elementary level as we continue to build houses, and that continues to be filled by um, young families. But um, at the uh, high school level, you'll start to see some of those kind of the pinery era, era housing developments produce fewer um, high school students. And so... 
Um, housing all around the district that's kind of of that vintage and has held strong with high school and college age uh, children will begin to trail off a little bit. And so that's some of the uh, kind of built-in decline that we're expecting. Also, you're seeing some softness in the middle school level as some of those uh, areas from prior booms um, continued, those children matriculate out into college and into um, uh, uh, their working lives. Uh, so this slide shows uh, projected and historic enrollment by district operated programs and schools um, and charter schools. Uh, and I think in summary, the important thing to point out about this slide is that you're, you're not seeing a migration from one to the other. This is the assumption based on his, historical, um, what we've, historically what we've seen that charters are sta have stable enrollment. They're fully enrolled. Um, so there is some growth at the uh, Lehman Bayou Gulch campus that is projected in those in the years 2024 and out. But what you're seeing is the pool of total enrollment is getting smaller and smaller every year and charters are staying stable. So our um, neighborhood schools is where you feel that smaller and smaller cohorts. And that Lehman Bayou Gulch campus was um, uh, forecast and populated and adjustments were made in adjacent schools based on pre-registration to the campus. So we were very careful to monitor um, who was applying for the program and we were able to obtain that data uh, from Lehman's leadership. As current as December 20th <laughs> when we release rejections. I'll let you take these ones. Uh, Castleview, you can see again, um, this is an area where I'm concerned. Um, I wish I could manufacture about 500 um, uh, acres of vacant land in that area and start building more houses on it to pump these numbers back up. But I think this is what you're seeing uh, is uh, for, the, for the Castleview attendance area, we're looking at probably 50 or 60 certificates of occupancy for 2023, and that just didn't produce enough replacement children to compensate for the kids that were lost. The um, uh, Dawson's Creek uh, development is in this attendance area. Uh, the future may uh, hold a new reality for the five schools in that part of town if we assign that development to um, these schools, but uh, given the interest rate circumstances, we're at least three or four years away from any sort of a change there. Uh, this next feeder shows, let's see, Douglas County High School. Um, a lot of this, uh, we're seeing some, what I would call strength there coming from Crystal Valley Ranch, which uh, is uh, assigned to this um, high school campus. So you see uh, some of the schools that have overflow enrollment, kids that are being bused four or five miles to school. Um, are in the Douglas County High School feeder. So we're seeing um, some uh, good enrollment numbers there as those areas continue to grow from that facility void. Um, and then you see the uh, uh, charter, um, I think a little bit of a charter enrollment change as a result of the Lehman Gulch share of that market that uh, pops up into this growth profile as well. Uh, the next feeder would be um, Chaparral. Uh, Shap family continues to do well. That part of um, uh, Parker has um, still has some active growth. Um, there's actually, I'm beginning to see some corporate owned housing in that area where investors are buying homes and leasing them to young families who wouldn't otherwise qualify. Um, but again, we're seeing relative stability there. Um, next feeder we're looking at would be uh, Ponderosa. And this is the growth from, um, uh, from developments that are over on the east side of Castle Rock um, and some of the developments that are in South Parker, uh, Meadow Ridge, Cielo, um, other developments that have housing that is priced below $600,000 in some cases are keeping these numbers uh, viable. And then on the right there, you see the a uh, bump from the Lehman uh, Gulch uh, new campus coming online and fully enrolling uh, more or less uh, in its first two years. Um, let's see, next feeder would be Legend where we have a lot of decline from a lot of 
housing that was built kind of during my heyday, I guess, uh, when I was following Douglas County growth fairly carefully and when we were looking at a lot of year-round schooling, a lot of that housing um, has um, uh, uh, is larger homes on larger lots. And unfortunately, those can't be priced in a manner where a young family could buy those. So take an average house in the Pinery that may be on a third acre lot and be a 2,800, 3,100 square foot house. But regardless of its age, we're not going to be able to price that to be able to be sellable to a young family with elementary age children. So that's what's been happening in that legend feeder system for the last 10 years because of the nature of a lot of the housing that is there that is affecting uh, school enrollments in that area. Uh, next slide shows Highlands Ranch. You can see uh, the decline that we've been watching for the next um, eight to 12 years as um, Highlands Ranch, which was one of the first big master plan communities in Douglas County. Um, it used to be a day's ride from Castle Rock on a horse. So, um, you know, and, and, and as you know, everything has filled in, but uh, that community was massive. It put tens of thousands of children um, into Douglas County schools. And what has happened with Highlands Ranch is what has happened with every other big master plan development around the United States is as housing gets to be about 35 years old, it starts producing significantly fewer children. And that is what is happening here. It is just like us getting old, just like me getting old. Um, Still a very vital community, a lot of infill development, a lot of new apartment buildings being built, but as far as the bread and butter of student yield, the majority of the area that could be filled with single family detached homes has been consumed in a smartly planned, beautiful master plan community. We just have lower yield there because of the average uh, age of the home. Next feeder would be Mountain Vista, uh, same thing. Um, uh, same area, more or less, um, beginning to look at some real um, uh, lower middle school numbers uh, in that area as um, the uh, student yield starts to spill over into the secondary uh, schools. So another area where we're looking at um, some uh, um, decline from that housing. Uh, next feeder would be uh, Rock Canyon. Um, newer area. Um, not as profound as the other two, but still we're starting to see the leading edge of that kind of um, community change and a little bit of generational change because a lot of this housing is higher value housing. And uh, again, it's going to have the same future that the Pinery style housing had as a lot of this higher value housing becomes difficult to attain for young families. I think here too, you'll see the stable or slight, very slightly increasing um, elementary school populations with the assumption that as the, the canyons builds out, even though we're seeing lower student yields than, than we anticipated because of the price of those homes, we are still ante anticipating some, some growth there. <clears throat> uh, Thunder Ridge, again, we're looking at quite a bit of generational competition. Um, Solstice has been really putting um, very attractive homes online from a uh, pricing standpoint. A lot of what was designed five or eight years ago in Sterling Ranch was larger lots and higher value homes. So a little of what, of what we're seeing in Sterling Ranch was how the community was planned, how the subdivisions were platted. And the smaller lots are, believe it or not, going to produce more children because we're going to be able to build a smaller home on those lots and it will be more um, attractive from a price standpoint for a younger family. But um, some of what we're seeing here with uh, growth in that area uh, being offset by generational change and some house price impact is evident in this table where we're looking at being uh, relatively stable even though we're adding hundreds of homes to that community every year. And that's all we have. I'll, I'll close us out just uh, letting directors know that we will be back with what does this all mean in terms of capital planning and capacity relief and balancing enrollment. So we didn't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. But 
um, we will be back with that conversation. It's probably another 20 minute presentation in itself, but um, open for any questions from directors. Director Thompson. Thank you. What is the enrollment capacity for the new Lehman campus? I believe 1150 was their uh, full build out number that they provided 1152. us. 1152, we're projecting them at 650 for next year, which is what um, they had provided to us that they were going to open in 2024 with. Okay, um, yeah, because I, I noticed that jump um, the, it was almost double um, in the charter jump. So, but 1,100 is a significant number. So. Yeah, yeah, and we, again, we get those, we get those numbers directly from them. We do try to, for a new charter school, correlate it with and be, be realistic with what we're seeing and during open enrollment. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of enrollment that happens between December 2023 and August of 2024, so. Okay, um, and then just, you know, more talking about enrollment decline for the district. Um, how does that compare to what we're seeing at the state level? You would be a good one to answer that. Um, very consistent with what other big districts that I would consider peers to us are experiencing. So, for example, just Littleton School District, similar rate of decline. Obviously, they're a third or a quarter of our a quarter of our size. So different situation. We're looking at Cherry Creek being a declining district as well. Um, I'm looking at Lewis Palmer School District having a lot of housing growth that's priced well, but um, we continue to see some of these generational changes in that district as well. Going on around the corner, I'm also working in Elizabeth and um, a lot of kind of price appropriate housing and independence, but interest rates are just beating up people so much that some of those subdivisions have slowed down, but our growth outlook for that district is uh, stronger. But as I look around the state, there are probably 10 or 12 big districts that are looking at enrollment decline and are looking at diminished birth rates and are looking at school utilization rates that are declining in pocketed areas where housing stocks tend to be older and birth rates have declined. Um, in areas where there is more affordable housing, like along the Highway 85 corridor, going out toward Lock Bowie and Hudson, all the way to Fort Morgan, all the way to the Kansas border, we're looking at a lot of that housing that's still in the fours, meaning 400,000 something. A lot of young families are gravitating out into that area and are actually changing their enrollment plans to get into a place where they could actually afford to live in a new home. El Paso County, we have had a lot of enrollment loss everywhere except uh, D49 and um, a lot of utilization uh, concerns with schools. Um, those uh, builders and developers in El Paso County were a little bit more quick on their feet than anybody else in the state and started down zoning, I guess, or up zoning. I don't know exactly what the phrase would be, but they started uh, taking a, an acre that might have had eight homes on it and make it have 14 homes on it and price those lower and build a lot of what we call the cityscapes price project product, which is a three-story house on a very skinny lot with two parking spaces on the ground floor. And so there's a lot of that in El Paso County that's affordable that could be had for 385 or 440. And so they've kind of responded very quickly, but a lot of us that already had developments that were platted and higher higher in housing planned we weren't really able to respond and so a lot of that housing just isn't being sold right now but i would say there are probably 10 or 12 districts around the state of colorado that have significant enrollment decline concerns and then in washington state there are 12 in alaska there are four in oregon there are eight or nine in Idaho, we're starting to see some squishiness in some parts of that state where um, um, housing costs are beginning to affect young families. So we're, we're part of a trend that's happening all over the Western US. Um, so I know that our state average, it, the enrollment decline is 1.81%, and this is just for you guys for context. So we're at uh, 1.44. 
um, in decline, and so the state average is 1.81. Um, I do have a question. I think it's probably for you, um, Aaron. Um, do we have a feedback loop with, you know, our county commissioners, with our different cities about like the impact of enrollment, some of the things that we learn about housing? I mean, do we have some sort of feedback loop that we provide them this context as well when they're making decisions? Thank you for that question. Yes, we work with all of our municipalities to um, make sure that they understand the impact of, of declining enrollment as well as the impact of building housing developments in voids um, that don't have schools. So, um, and just to provide further context to your last question, Director Thompson, um, 43 of the 64 counties in our district saw declining, in our state saw declining enrollment. So. You are absolutely correct. We are a reflection of what we are seeing across Colorado. Um, I do think, though, that that the bright spot that we have, um, as they referred to, is is we do have up and coming developments. We do still have um, land, and so we certainly aren't going to be in. Um, as much of a challenging situation as a district that is truly um, landlocked and doesn't have any possibility for any more development outside of urban renewal. Director Meek. Sure. Superintendent Kane, thanks for going into that. I think this is such a complex thing to explain to our community. And so, Mr. Bingham, you always amaze me with how much knowledge you have and you're able to speak about and provide context statewide, nationwide, et cetera. Um, I think having some of that in the slide deck would be really, really helpful for those who aren't seeing this or listening to all of the explanation. I mean, how you went into talking about the birth rate changes, the cultural changes, interest rates, all of that is really important context. And I just worry that people will miss that when, when they look at the slides, um, because most people probably aren't watching this, but they might pull up the slides. And so I think that is just such an important part of the, the context to provide to people. And I appreciated hearing it here tonight. Um, it would be great to archive that as well. Okay. Anything else? Director Moore. You know, I don't have a, a question, just a comment about how fascinating your work is and how much detail goes into being able to help show the trends and help us predict the future and what we're probably going to see. And um, and I was around this county when it was the fastest growing county in the nation. And that 20 years later, what does that turn into? <laughs> it turns into what you, you're showing us here tonight. But I just want to tell you how fascinated I am and how exceptional your, your data was. Thank you. Thank you. And just um, to for everybody to know that this presentation was given to LRPC um, just this last week as well. So, All right. Director Meek. Really quick, I think we are probably running behind. Um, Mr. Bingham, I noticed you were helping D51 as well. I, I think you work with districts all over the state and they had a, a really extensive process of having a community driven committee, right? Helping them with their recommendations and all. So I'm just hoping that maybe we can draw on some of your knowledge as we're moving forward. I think um, you have a lot to offer, so thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> On to number seven, superintendent monitoring report, and number five, financial well-being. 10-minute presentation, 10-minute discussion. Okay, I will do my best to make up for some lost time here. Okay, so as you know, we have five um, superintendent monitoring reports based on the board's current five ends, although whatever that might look like after the retreat and going forward, we'll adjust. Um, this is the current schedule for when we turn in those monitoring reports. The one in question tonight is around financial well-being and the ends and executive, the sub ends and executive limitations pertaining to financial well-being are up here. I won't read them to you. Um, so the first sub-end 
Um, similar to what we did for academic excellence, we've made some adjustments in our interpretations. Um, so the sub end is the Board of Education and all district employees are good stewards of the financial resources belonging to the district on behalf of students and taxpayers. Compliance will be demonstrated when the district operates under policies and procedures that provide strong internal controls to protect taxpayer assets, when funds are allocated and spent transparently and in alignment with the board's ends and district priorities, and the district is operating efficiently. Um, and so the evidence provided is listed up here, and all of these links are live, and of course, um, it is in the actual monitoring report Self, so you can see a lot of our um, a lot of the information is on our financial transparency page. Um, we do have incredibly transparent financials where taxpayers can go in and look up individual expenditures, um, and we get everything posted on time when we need to. The um, policy seven B regarding funds and expenditures being handled equitably, efficiently, transparently, responsibly, and purposefully to manage the benefit of all students. So that was a mouthful. So the um, interpretation goes into each one of those. Um, compliance will be demonstrated when timely, understandable, and informative data is provided to the board, its applicable board committees, and the public. Compliance will additionally be demonstrated when resources are allocated and spent in alignment with the board's ends and district priorities, and budget allocations to schools are handled through a formula generated by a cohort of principals and district leaders with supporting documentation for all allocations for the purpose of serving the unique needs of each student in alignment with the district's mission and vision. And finally, compliance will be demonstrated when the district is operating efficiently. And so um, the evidence regarding those, we've linked our various um, presentations. We've talked a little bit about the committees and you can see the financial statements and then the Board of Education presentations um, regarding financials over the last year. Additionally, um, we've got our site-based budgeting information. So we've talked extensively about this last year. Um, our DCSD financial transparency page, the detailed expenditures, and the proposed budget um, and publication requirements. So we do give legal notice, of course, for all of our budgets. Um, the next one is all district financial transactions are legal, ethical, and appropriate in keeping with district regulations and goals. Compliance will be demonstrated when the district files um, unmodified audit reports including the federally mandated single audit and other required reports to regulatory agencies in a timely manner. Any reported findings are addressed, corrected, and reviewed by the Fiscal Oversight Committee and reported to the Board of Education when appropriate. And so here is the um, evidence with respect to that. So you can see our audit accreditation report um, from the CDE, Fiscal Health, um, reports and our annual comprehensive financial report, um, et cetera, that go towards um, that end. We also included our investment monitoring, so you can see the quarterly financial reports in that regard. Um, Long-term financial stability and accountability has been established, maintained, and monitored in order to accomplish Board of Education end goals. Um, Compliance will be demonstrated when fund balances are maintained in a responsible manner as required by law and board policy, and that expenditures are spent in accordance with the approved budget set to further the mission and vision of the district. Compliance will be further demonstrated when the district's overall credit ratings and ratios set by the state auditor reflect best practices set by the school finance community and recommended by the Colorado Department of Education. And so we do meet all of those um, all of those requirements. Our financials do meet all of those requirements, and you can see that we um, have our financial audit, um, our quarterly financial reports. We keep our master capital plan updated. Um, we have worked with the bond and mill oversight committee to show those expenses, and the report from the office of the state auditor. And then finally, we have the um, executive limitations with respect to, uh, the first one is with respect to budgeting. Um, and so this one, I'll just go to the interpretation. Compliance will be demonstrated when a financial plan 
including a minimum three-year outlook, has been presented and approved by the board in compliance with state law and board policy, and is reflective of a balanced operating budget continued with responsible, combined with responsible, as in purposeful, fund balance allocation. So this is a situation we will find ourselves in perhaps um, very soon. See next presentation. Um, you can see the um, pieces of uh, evidence here with respect to that. And again, just the way that this, um, that the ends are structured, we often have the same pieces of evidence for the different portions of the ends and executive limitations. Um, this, the financial administration executive limitation, compliance will be demonstrated when a budget is developed that assures financial conditions that are consistent with achieving the board ends. And the five-year outlook represents continued fiscal health. Compliance will be further demonstrated when the district is in compliance with state law and board policy with respect to seeking board approval over financial matters and the annual audit reflects no material misstatements. Um, and so you, again, you can see our annual audit, quarterly financial statements, and our accreditation report. And then I think this is the last one. Um, this is around asset protection. Compliance will be demonstrated when the district operates under policies and procedures that provide strong internal controls to protect taxpayer assets. Um, and so again, you can see that through the district's financial audit through the investment performance reports or statements and um, through the supplier spend threshold that all went through policy and um, were approved by the Board of Education. So we have links to all of those. Um, I know that was really, really fast and CFO Schleisner is here to um, help me answer questions. Um, if you have any detailed questions regarding the financial monitoring report, this is one area where the Board of Education continuously sees um, reports in this regard, so that's why I went so quickly. Director Thompson. I just wanted to make a comment about um, being able to access all this information on the district website. I found it personally relatively easy to navigate. I could look up what was happening at a school level down to when they buy stickers for the front desk. So that's obviously an example I read. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to make a comment about that, the ease of it. Thank you. We're very proud of our transparency in Douglas County. I just think uh, as a board, we've talked to just for consideration for us. Um, and I think we'll be talking about this at our retreat. But do we need this as one of our monitoring reports or does it fall under um, executive limitations instead? So just something to consider as a board. Anything else? Easiest monitoring That's report it. ever. <laughs> thank um, you. Th thank you very much. Hopefully I made some time up. You sure did. All right. Um, we are, without exception, going to take a 10-minute recess. So we're going to be back at 6.42.
All right, we are back in session and on to number nine, which is funding next steps cap capital needs recommendation. Superintendent Kane will have a 30 minute presentation fo followed by a 20 minute Q&A. Okay, hi again. Um, and CEO of Rich Cosgrove is here to uh, assist, so he'll be doing some of this and I will, and we have a principal here. Okay, so on the agenda for tonight regarding this presentation are bond funding next steps, um, emergency capital needs, costs of waiting, proposal for immediate needs, and next steps. Um, so this slide is actually from right after November. Um, as you know, of course, we did not win 5B in November. And so we've the staff has been looking at how we can manage um, in the meantime and get us to a place where perhaps we can get funding through bond. Um, we will continue to engage with our community. We will use reserves and available resources for emergency capital needs, but the backlog will continue to grow and the risk of temporary closures will increase. Um, we will be unable, of course, to address overcrowding with new neighborhood schools. And um, without a bond, uh, we'll have to use creative solutions and um, it is staff's opinion that we will need to go back to the voters at some point. Okay, so challenges. And, and I do want, I want to start again by thanking our voters so much for 5A and saying what a tremendous difference 5A has made for so many of our teachers and staff. Um, and certainly our system has been in a very euphoric state, um, feeling really good and feeling like they can continue working here. We've had people coming back. It's been great. And the challenge of not winning 5B is actually very tremendous. Um, emergency capital needs. Our buildings are continuing to age and our capital needs are becoming increasingly urgent. Um, as you all know, the 2018 bond covered the backlog of the most urgent tier one and tier two capital needs through about 2021. Um, we currently have important capital needs identified all the way through 2028, and some of which have been backlogged since before the 2018 bond, because the 2018 bond did not cover all of our capital needs. It covered our most urgent tier one and tier two needs at that time. We have $10 million of immediate capital needs that could cause a school to close. So we, this is $10 million that we need to address very, very quickly. Um, and I have uh, a principal here who will talk a little bit after Rich about the impact on his high school. But Chaparral High School, um, two of their three boilers are leaking and the third one has failed. Um, Soaring Hawk and Frontier Valley both have only one operational boiler and the second one has failed. Those are just two examples. The longer we delay capital maintenance, the more it will cost. Um, and these are just a couple of examples where delaying capital maintenance is ending up costing our taxpayers more in the long run. Um, Eagle Academy had an HVAC RTU that failed. It was partially repaired, it needs to be replaced, and while it failed, the temporary cooling in that relatively small space was $62,000 that we'll never get back. Um, and each year that we delay fixing that RTU, it adds $30,000 in inflation costs. Um, another example is Stone Mountain Elementary, which has a hot water boiler that has failed and was replaced um, as emergency project with increased costs. So these needs are very real and very urgent. And I'm actually going to have Rich, come, uh, Mr. Cosgrove, come up here and talk about the next um, few slides with the continued urgent capital needs. Good evening, directors. There is a significant and real cost of waiting. And it, not only financially, but the big item is the potential closure of schools, which is our reality very soon. There's inflation. That's just math. In our master capital plan for 7 million square feet, over 79% the size of Rhode Island, it's 900 million to a billion. That's pretty typical. It's not as big as Jeffco's or DPS, but it's pretty typical for the acreage and the square foot that we have. 
Every year, just 5% is 45 to $50 million. Right now, we continue to track with owner's reps, with major contractors. We're looking at 5 to 6% inflation. Inflation's only gone down once, temporarily, and that was 2008. And then it came right back. And at the, at the best, it remains flat. Increasing backlog of capital needs. Every year, through our capital improvement plan, we have building components that are hitting their life cycle. And I'll get to this in the next slide, but we built so many schools. We built over 30 schools from 98 to 2008. And so all of those 15 to 20-year life cycle components are coming due. These are boilers for heating, hot water boilers for domestic hot water, chillers, cooling towers for cooling, rooftop units. We have over 850 rooftop units in the district, over 60 just at Douglas County High School. And if a rooftop unit goes down like it went down yesterday in this building, it will not push cool air and hot air. So yesterday we were in the 50 degrees in this building. A rooftop unit um, has been in the master capital plan for years for this facility, and a belt broke. We replaced it today, but in the meantime, our special needs staff in the basement, uh, it was almost intolerable. And that happens at schools, like for example, Acres Green. A couple of times a year, they have to move students because the air handling unit breaks. It's been in the bond, but the bond failed, unfortunately. So that's on our list of immediate needs. We have electrical switchgear, panels and generator. If a switchgear fails, there's no power to the building. It is not distributed anywhere. Um, we have generators that are required by code. If you lose power, the generators kick on, and for life safety, first responders can get in the building, students can get out of the building, and you see your emergency lighting, your backup power, your exit signs, and the like. Fire alarm systems. The 2018 bond had a good number of fire alarm systems, and to put it in perspective, before the 2018 bond passed, almost every other day there was a fire alarm issue and a first responder, a fire department had to come. Smoke detectors, relays bad, panels not communicating, things like that. Controls. Mechanical controls are like the telephone of a school. Imagine controlling every piece of device that heats, cools, and distributes electricity, including the carbon monoxide detectors, the gas detectors for leaks. Imagine controlling that with, with a 15-year-old cell phone. That is the equivalent of a controls uh, function in a school. You need to update that because parts are not available. We have 3,000 plus rooms. We have 10,000 controls that we monitor. And during the wind chill, two weeks ago, we were monitoring that and we were able to respond over 30 times to protect our buildings. Now, we still had seven water leaks, but we were able to respond immediately because we saw the temperature dropping, and we were able to control remotely all of the heat and run it in fully occupied mode. So the controls are essential. And all of these items are expensive. Just one boiler is two to 300000 We have three boilers um, in middle schools, uh, three boilers... Uh, or more, up to eight in high school, depending on the age and the pods of a high school. And we have two boilers in every elementary school. So we try to provide redundancy. And just to put it in perspective, not including inflation, if you just add the cost in two years of those items that are going to hit the five-year life cycle in our five-year master capital plan, that's a $70 million increase by waiting two years. The cost of reactive versus proactive, typically it's about four times as much. So think your water heater, do you replace it or do you wait till the bottom drops out? And then repair your basement. Do you replace the tire on your car when it's getting low or do you get a tow? That's going to cost a lot more. This is a real life example. So when we have a water line break, um, several weeks ago in Chaparral High School, our master plumber was there till 2 in the morning repairing a leak so they could have the wrestling tournament that following Saturday. Um, these are real issues. The sprinkler line breaks. Um, the sprinkler lines and connections get old, and when the water molecules expand, when it starts to freeze, that pressure sometimes can, can break it. 
Or we see the temperature dip on our controls, we go and we see the head starting to leak and we immediately drain the system. Um, so the collateral damage is significant. Expected delivery times um, are an increased cost. You're, you're trying to accelerate a supply chain and that's gonna cost extra money as well as overtime and weekend work. So these are real examples of last year. We spent over 400,000. We had um, over 10 fire watches. So when you have a fire alarm panel that's not communicating and reporting out and being able to monitor, by law, we have to go on a fire watch. It's a 24-7 uh, fire watch. Someone there every hour writing a log and calling in that the building is safe. So you can have a school without a fire uh, alarm system, but it's very expensive. Stone Mountain, we lost the hot water boiler. We had to get one. In the meantime, we paid over 90000 for a temporary hot water boiler. Same with Thunder Ridge. Um, and Prairie Crossing, we had a, a cooling tower needed because we lost the cooling tower. A cooling tower is, um, I would say, big as a fifth wheel. I mean, these are big pieces of equipment that you roll up outside of school and you hook up the ductwork and you're, and you're feeding cool air for the chiller in the school. Eagle Academy, uh, Superintendent Kane mentioned that. That is a rooftop unit almost as big as a semi-truck. Uh, it's huge. There's one rooftop unit on that entire school, and we lost part of it, and we were able to get temporary cooling. But in the meantime, we install carbon dioxide monitors in every room to make sure we were flowing enough air, because we had no rooftop unit circulating air, to make sure it was safe. Sage Canyon, Sagewood, we had temporary chillers and Mesa. We had a temporary chiller ready to hook up, but the day before school in August, we were able to repair, limp along the uh, permanent chiller. And so temporary closures can occur. These reactive measures take time. We have located pieces of equipment and firms, companies that can provide this, but you can't immediately get it delivered. And just to hook up a, uh, a boiler, you need to have an engineer, a contractor. You need to understand, look at the prints, understand what kind of connections are needed, and that takes weeks. So in the meantime, uh, you don't have any heat in that school. And this just shows graphically, the 2018 bond helped, but even during the bond, you can see the repair and maintenance needs increasing because of the backlog was exceeding what was in the bond. So um, I'm, I'm going to just summarize what Rich talked about as far as the cost of waiting. Um, inflation is 45 to $50 million a year. That's 45 to $50 million a year that taxpayers will have to pay for the exact same item um, that they could have had right now for, for the prices right now versus waiting a year, 45 to $50 million more. Um, the increasing backlog for district-run schools and buildings is $70 million a year. Moving mobiles, this is how we handle capacity when we can't, um, when we can't manage capacity in our school voids. Moving in addition to the many things that you know, we don't like about mobiles. That's certainly not in an ideal environment for our kids. Um, but moving them for capacity is a million dollars a year. Um, longer crowded bus routes to overflow schools. So we actually did the math on how much additional money we are spending by busing kids to overflow schools and out of their communities versus what it would cost if they had a neighborhood school in their community that, that they were also being bused to. That's $250,000 a year. Um, maintenance of older buses. So by not getting new buses, which were in the bond, um, by not getting new buses, we are spending $2 million per year on maintenance that we would not be spending if we had the new buses. Um, temporary building systems, Rich just went over that, that's about a million dollars a year. And um, an increase in operations and maintenance costs and services of about a million dollars a year. Um, temporary school closures, I feel like this is the line where you say priceless, like I, I can't even price what it would be to have to take children out of their school for a period of time because we can't heat, cool, water, whatever, the school. 
Um, so for every year that we do not pass 5B, it costs our district and our taxpayers more than $125 million. Um, for every year that we do not pass 5B, it's $125 million more that our taxpayers will eventually have to pay in order to um, put all of these components in place. We included in the board agenda item a proposal for immediate capital needs, urgent capital needs, and some testimonials from some of our principals in terms of what our schools and our kids are experiencing every single day. And along in that regard, um, Greg Gochi is here from Chaparral High School to just talk to you all for a few minutes about what this looks like, has looked like at Chaparral High School, and what continuing to wait looks like at Chaparral High School. So thank you for being here tonight, Greg. So thank you. Um, it's kind of a buzzkill right there, right? So listening to all the stuff that we have to do. My mom, I have a book on my shelf, says the crazy stuff my dad said. And I have some crazy stuff my mom also said. So this is one of those things. My mom would say, coming and talking to you about this is like complaining because you got hung with a new rope. So I want to echo the sentiments of Superintendent Kane. Passing 5A made my job amazing. And thank you for all the work that you did and put forth and made that happen, especially to all of you. I think I told Danny this as well. Staff members are so important to our, the running of our facilities. They make the difference. They're the people that are in front of the room. Books, they're important, but not like a person. And so passing 5A made my job easier because I have three retirements this year and two in science and one in math that I would not have looked forward to um, having not passed 5A. But the failure of 5B really puts a lot of work on you all and, and them to make decisions, very tough and difficult decisions. So at Chaparral, and I, that's kind of an embarrassing picture, but um, <laughs> we, and I put, I, I don't know if you saw the testimonial that I had written, but we have three boilers. So we're one of your cheaper schools. We only have three boilers, but we have, we have an amazing facility. And the amazing facility looks just like your brand new buildings because Carson, the lead building engineer when I was here, passed on to Jose, passed on to Paul Warner, who's our, your current lead building engineer, makes that place sparkle. It looks like a brand new building. But we all know the bones underneath that building may not be new. And we're faced with aging boilers that's being held together with bailing wire and duct tape. And we've got a couple of things in our theater where our seats are rocking back and forth. And you have an amazing theater program at, at all of your buildings. And so I'm most passionate about Chaparral. But in all of your buildings, you have such amazing performing arts and sports and athletics. I think your basketball teams, almost all nine of us, are competing for uh, league and state championships. And you know we have a track issue where I think superintendent came out and, and showed that when we were trying to get 5A passed. And I'm confident we'll have a state championship cross country team as early as next year. And we need to support, support this. Our mission statement at Chaparral High School says that we will provide excellence in academics, athletics, and activities. We'll help our students to set and achieve high individual goals as they grow into lifelong learners and car caring adults and responsible citizens. Well, we, the elevator speech of that mission statement is, is that we're going to be an excellent, well-rounded school. We're going to know our kids, and we're going to help them grow up. But to help our kids be a well-rounded school, we have to provide excellence in academics, athletics, and activities. You can't do it in a cold building. And you can't do it with subpar uh, equipment. And so we have an amazing, I know I've said that word a number of times, but it's true. There are an amazing community at Chaparral High School, and I'm sure that that's echoed nine times over in your other schools and our feeders that, that feed into that. And um, I don't envy coming up here telling you thank you so much for getting 5A passed and thank to the community for your support with 5A, but we need a little more, right? We need a little more. We need that 5B to be passed because... Um, what I would mention, I think, is if we have three boilers, like I mentioned, with 
one of your cheaper schools. One's running. One's shut down, because if, if we turn it on, it floods. And the other one's currently leaking. So we're overtaxing the system when we're running on two boilers when the building was designed for three. If those shut down remote, oh my god, I guess I can't even talk to you about that, right? Um, we've lived through that already, right? And I don't want to go back there. So, um, and that's not even to mention the windows that are leaking and then rusting out some pillars that are holding the roof up. That doesn't mention the intercom system that we made fun of when we were trying to get the, the, uh, the election passed. It doesn't mention the seats in the theater that are wobbly and you know reclining seats when it's not supposed to be reclining seats. So um, again, just thank you for your time. Thank you for your consideration. And thank you guys for what you do to keep our buildings going. This man right here, we had a stream of flood that was fill filling a 50 gallon bucket well, maybe not 50, 33 gallons. I don't want to over-exaggerate. It was filling a 33-gallon trash can in about five hours. So, you know, our, we were trying to organize custodians to come in over the weekend to do it because we couldn't shut our building down because your buildings are being used by the community. So thank you all. Okay, hey, that's just one principal's perspectives. And when I visited Chaparral High School recently, one of the things that the kids showed me was their track. Um, it's gotten about this thin, which means that when um, students are running around the track and they fall, they are much more likely to injure themselves um, and sometimes very seriously. So those are the kinds of issues that we're seeing throughout our buildings. Um, so here's our proposal. So we have, we have a couple of proposals. One. Um, as mentioned in our previous meeting, we are proposing a $20 million purposeful set aside of fund balance. 10 million of that is for our immediate needs um, that could close a school. And you have that detailed list on the board packet. 10 million is for urgent needs that also could close a school. Um, and, but the, 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 or the uh, immediate needs are first and then the urgent needs, they're all urgent. Um, and you can see what that 10 million is in both cases. This will at least build a bridge. This builds a bridge about of about a year. Um, $20 million of your fund balance builds a bridge of about a year. And this does not address a year's worth of capital needs. This addresses what's on fire. Um, this back, the backlog in total, which is a lot larger than this list, can result in infrastructure failures and, and temporary school closures. And again, if we were to keep up with capital maintenance the way that we all do in our homes, um, it would cost this district for our 111 buildings, it would cost us $35 million a year according to the master capital plan in order to actually keep up um, with maintenance. So while this $20 million set aside that staff is proposing from fund balance, it is one-time money from fund balance. We cannot keep doing that every year. Um, this is just to build us a bridge in the same way that we built a bridge to 5A by offering things like retention stipends that also came from one-time dollars in order to build a bridge to 5A. So I just want to share with you a little bit about um, the history of bonds in the school district. So just to back up for a moment, our taxpayers pay three line items. Um, they pay school district taxes that go towards the School Finance Act um, dollar amount that, that the district gets. We get about $10,000 per student from the state of Colorado to educate our students. And the very first line item, the big line item, that goes into that $10,000 a student it covers. Our local taxpayers cover somewhere around $4,000 of that $10,000 per student, and the state covers the rest. The next one is the mill levy override, which of course, um, we just passed 5A. Again, so thankful to our taxpayers. The last line are the mills that go towards debt payments. That's the bond mills. Um, that goes toward debt payments. So essentially, we have to ask the taxpayers every time we want to take out debt for the taxpayers' permission to take out debt. And the taxpayers then, through the bond mills, pay that debt payment um, over time. 
We, these, this, this goes all the way back to 1984, and this shows the bonds that were passed through elections in our district from 1984 to present day. From 1984 to about 2006 in general, we passed a bond about every three to four years. So we maintained a very similar mill level in our debt payments because essentially when we were paying off debt, we were taking out new debt so that the debt payments were more or less the same and we were able to build um, all of the school buildings that we built in that time. And then we went for 12 years between 2006 and 2018. So we were doing it every three to four years and suddenly we went 12 years and we are just still trying to catch up from being so far behind. So I wanna describe this slide really carefully. Um, I have two things on this slide. So first of all, along the left are mills. This is the number of mills that our taxpayers have paid and are paying for debt payments in Douglas County School District from 1998 to today. So you can see starting in 1998, we were at about 10 mills for debt payments. We went up as high as about 15 mills. During that time period, that's when we were building schools. We built lots and lots of schools, as Rich mentioned, mentioned during that time period. And so, and it's when we were passing bonds. We were consistently passing bonds. Then our mills dropped as we stopped passing bonds and we were paying off debt, the number of mills that our taxpayers were paying towards debt payments dropped dramatically. That's a very significant tax decrease for our taxpayers. I was asked recently by a citizen why we would have allowed our mills to ratchet down from 15 to where it sits today, which is five. Um, why would we allow it to ratchet down from 15 to five? What we should have been doing, um, this citizen pointed out, is getting, getting new debt in order to keep it at around 15 so that we can consistently take care of all of our capital maintenance. We can't do that. We can't take out debt without an approval of the taxpayers, even if taking out that debt does not mean an increase in taxes. Um, and so that's why that ratcheting down effect has happened um, over the last decade or so. You can see that 2000, the bonds are all listed in the year right after they passed, because that's when we took out the debt. Um, you can see 2019, that $250 million bond, we dropped again. Um, we tried in 2022, we tried in 2023. Um, we're now at 2024. So if, if hypothetically we were to pass um, a, bill, uh, a bond in 2024, it would keep our mills steady so we would at least stop ratcheting down. And then if we were to ask for um, another bond in four years, as we once did in this district, to be able to at least maintain capital maintenance of all of our buildings, that actually would um, result in the, the mill starting to ratchet back up just a little bit. So this is just kind of showing you the past and the future, but this is a really important uh, chart for our taxpayers to understand. We used to collect 15 mills for um, debt payments so that we could take care of our capital needs in Douglas County School District. Today we collect about five. This is just a little bit of history for um, our citizens and for you all. These are the various bonds that were approved, as you saw in um, prior slides. And you can see what schools were built um, with these bonds over the years. So again, this is, this is when we were building schools pretty consistently in quite a few of them. And this is that time period of us building schools is why we're gonna see, we're seeing a really big challenge coming up because all of these schools are aging out and all of them are gonna hit us at once in terms of major components needing to be replaced. So, um, potentially returning to the voters. Um, here are our options in addressing this challenge, both options with voter approval and without voter approval. So let me start with the options with voter approval. We could run a bond again for capital maintenance, replenishment, and construction. Um, and that bond, if it's around the 490, 484 
range, which is what we asked for in 2023, if we were to run that in 2024, that still maintains us at five mils. So it is not a tax change for our taxpayers. We um, have the option, there is a mill levy override that um, you can run specifically for capital maintenance. Many districts have passed a mill levy override for capital maintenance. Um, the good news about that is it's ongoing. So for example, if we know that our capital maintenance is $35 million a year, we could ask for a $35 million a year mill levy override um, for capital maintenance. That is an increase to our taxpayers. Um, it does help with the problem ongoing. So um, from staff's point of view, we think this is something that we recommend looking at in the future. Um, but doing a tax increase right now might be really challenging. We also have the option that's been talked about by the board to run one bond for capital maintenance and another bond for construction. So these are sort of options that that um, you all have in front of you in terms of if you want to go back to the taxpayers in 2024. Um, if we are unable to go back to the taxpayers, these are our, these are our only options. We can start to spend down fund balance, which we're already doing with the $20 million recommendation. That's a spend down of fund balance. You can do that for maybe three years. Um, we can we can take out COPs, certificates of participation, in a very, we only have a very limited capacity. This is essentially like borrowing money. It's, um, it's just putting up an asset. It's a little bit like a reverse mortgage. It's putting up an asset, and then we pay to lease our own asset, um, but we get money for that asset. So it's a little bit like borrowing money, but it's um, more like a reverse mortgage. We, can, we do have the ability to do that in order to raise capital, to be able to do some of the necessary new construction. However, paying the payment for that, um, the mortgage payment or the lease payment, means that we would have to make significant cuts to programming um, to our opportunities for kids across our district. Um, we would have to make significant ongoing cuts, which means people um, in buildings, in wherever, in order to be able to pay that lease payment and we certainly don't have the capacity to borrow COPs for um, everything that we would need. Those are kind of the two options if, if we aren't able to um, finance our capital needs in the way that other districts do and that was intended um, under the School Finance Act. So next steps. Um, for February 27th meeting, we will be asking you to consider an approval of the fund balance set aside as proposed based on the two lists attached. So it's very specific what we would be spending that $20 million fund balance set aside on. And I'll repeat just one more time for our listeners that that is a one-time temporary solution. Um, staff will be conducting polling in March and July so that we can provide the Board of Education with all of the information that you need to make a decision regarding 2024. Um, in the consideration of a potential 2024 bond, in the April meeting, we will provide you with polling results and our recommendations um, based on recommended next steps based on that polling. The June meeting is when we would present a draft bond plan for a potential 2024 bond. Um, and give you our initial recommendation, which I've already mentioned will likely be, it will likely be our recommendation that you consider a 2024 bond because we um, really are in desperate, in desperate need. This, whatever we propose for 2024 will look a little bit different than the 2022 and 2023 bonds. Those two were the same. You heard um, from our enrollment experts so we are analyzing all of the latest enrollment data, all the decisions that went into constructing the previous bond came from 2021 enrollment projections. So now we're, going, we're taking the latest and greatest enrollment projections to see how we can possibly um, potentially reduce new construction or how we can look at it a little bit differently. And again, um, I, 
are your retreat and how you all determine your ends and what you all determine is Douglas County School District's fundamental commitment to kids and families will also drive what that bond recommendation um, would look like specifically. So we would present that in June. And then of course, the last meeting in August is when you would make your final vote on a staff recommendation for a potential 2024 bond. Um, so uh, in conclusion, I, I, hope, I hope it was clear how we've gotten to the place that we are in terms of our inability to take care of our infrastructure. I'm just gonna throw this chart up one last time. When we were able to have the kind of debt capacity that 10 to 15 mills bought us, we had thriving modern school buildings available to all of our children. And since, since that time, since that massive drop, we now have languishing school buildings that are struggling to just be maintained, let alone modernized. Um, and that, that has been the reality for our district from that change in what we were able to collect. So I hope that was clear and I'm happy to take any questions along with Mr. Cosgrove and with Principal um, Gochi. Thank you so much. Just um, a question about the polling that's gonna happen. Um, I just wanna make sure we get a good sample size. I think that from my memory, and it could be really wrong, we didn't have a huge sample size in, in the last year's uh, polling. So are we gonna make sure that we get a larger sample size? Thank you very much for that question. Um, that's a really good question for a pollster. <laughs> what I will say is they, um, this is a science for pollsters, and so they do, they do the sample size that is sufficient to get them results that they are confident in within a margin of error. Um, if we ask them to do a higher sample size, which we absolutely can do, it will cost us um, more money, but if that will help the Board of Education feel um, more confident about those polling results, that's certainly something we will talk to them about. Yeah, and just to also clarify, when we do poll, uh, we will pull all the different strategies that we are looking at, like two different bonds or the mill or whatever. So um, the more different scenarios that we pull, the more expensive the poll will be. Um, and that I'm really glad you asked that, President Williams. Um, what, what we would recommend, oops, sorry. Going back to this, to the different options. Where did I put those? Going back to those different options, um, I'm not suggesting that we pull all three of those options. Um, it, is, it is our recommendation that we pull option number one. Um, if you run a mill in 2024 that is actually a tax increase for our taxpayers, um, I think that would have a much um, worse chance of passing than if we were to run a bond that isn't a tax increase for our taxpayers. Um, secondly, the mill would only cover, it would be a tax increase and it would only cover um, capital maintenance. So in order to address not just new construction but also things like the buses, um, in order to address all of that, that would be a second ballot initiative for a 5B. So you would look at a 5A, 5B situation um, again. And then on the last one with running two separate bonds, I put these up here because these are options you all have asked about in the past, but running two separate bonds, one for capital maintenance and one for new construction, I think we would probably have the same result that we had in the last election, which is we'll give you one, but we're not going to give you the other. Um, and so my recommendation would be that we focus our polling on a single bond for this cycle while looking at that mill for a future cycle. However, I will absolutely take direction from you all in terms of what you want to pull. If they pull too many different things, it does get, um, it does get very convoluted and they don't like doing that. Great, thank you. Director Meek. Yeah, President, President Williams, I kind of had similar questions and I'm actually wondering if maybe the board might want to be more engaged and the 
decision on the polling questions. And maybe we'd like to have either all of us or have a couple of us, but, but I, I do think the board wants to make sure that we get exactly what we feel like we need to make an informed decision. And so I think that's just something I'd like for us to think about, you know, moving forward. Um, so love the presentation. This was really helpful. Um, it actually makes me think of, of how I heard um, former Director Ray talk about 5B as being an investment in our students. And that's really how he talked about it when we were out talking with community members. And I, th I think, you know, it's an investment in our learning environment. It's an investment in the safety of our classrooms and the facilities. Um, it's addressing disparities across buildings. We have some built, you know, some buildings that are 30 years old, 40 years old, trying to compete with more brand new buildings, which I think leads to some of our challenges that we have with attracting students to certain schools. So I think, you know, it's, it's an investment in our students. I think what I saw on this presentation is a new element around, it's also um, focusing on the long-term benefits for our community. And so the cost savings piece, right? So when you talk about um, how proactive investments in infrastructure and upgrades and the preventative maintenance actually saves us money. It saves the taxpayers money. And I think that's a new talking point that I appreciated having those detailed examples as well. Um, we haven't talked about increasing property values, right? So newer buildings um, really attract individuals and help with property values. So I, I definitely appreciated the presentation and, and how you walk through things. Um, maybe if you could go to slide 11 and then 12. So slide 11, where you show between 2006 and 2018, there was no bond investment, right? So we operated, right? Our schools stayed open, but I think it came at the cost of diverting money that was paying our employees and our staff which led to us falling behind in being able to fund our employees at a competitive wage. Like everything's connected. And I think it's really helpful to help the community understand that as well, because I mean, we have options. An option is not to pass 5B or not to invest in some way. And what will happen is it will take money that would otherwise go into paying our employees, right? we would find a way. But I think what we've seen are the negative effects that happened because of that long period of time. So on slide number 12, and I'm done, I'll stop talking, I promise. Slide number 12, what I think I am seeing here is that in, if a bond were to pass in 2024, this November, that's the amount in 2025 of 490 million that would be able to be acquired, and it's an estimate, right? So around that amount, and that would keep the current mill rate where it is today. Am I reading that for the bond? Yes, you are reading that correctly, and, or however, I'm just gonna go ahead and say however. However, um, if we pass, uh, if we put out another bond in 2028, which we will need to. We have to maintain all of these environments for our kids, and at some point we're going to have to modernize um, our buildings. Um, if we were to pass something in 2028, that w the 2028 one will likely, if, if assessed values stay flat, which won't happen, but if they did, it would likely, the 2028 would likely result in perhaps starting to ratchet the mill up um, a little bit. But for the 2024 proposal, it would remain flat where it is today. Tight, but flat. Director Myers. So uh, just a couple of things and a couple of questions. Um, so I'm, what I say, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but it kind of felt like 
you know, you're preaching to the choir. We know this. I know this. And as a member of the community since 93 and being in that, in the school district, and then those years, I, I kind of wonder, and I don't know if you can answer this question, I kind of wonder as that person that was in the district with children and graduating, and now I'm in that group that has no children, you know, at home. And so, and that number appears to be growing larger, the number of people. And so we definitely have to hit that group somehow. And then I think the other group that besides educating our community with this information is reaching a probably the hardest, loudest critics of no taxes and trying to get this explanation out to them that what we're doing is really harming our kids and our schools. And is this really what we want Douglas County to be known for at Chaparral High School, that we have a boiler that's down and another one that's leaking? And I'm assuming, Mr. Gotchi, that your parents are aware of what's going on at Chaparral High School. They, they see and they, they are after tonight. Thank you very much for that. What I would tell you is what I was what I was mentioning when I was talking about our our maintenance staff is they do a, an amazing job of keeping this out of kids' brains so that they can focus on learning. They're not worried about not having heat at three o'clock or two thirty before the bell rings. They're they expect our school to be fine. And it is, and it looks just like Legend, who's you know 20 years younger. And I think those are the things that I think is important for us to start to, to talk about. So you're, you're right. And, and I as think what, just one, one yeah. address one more of your questions is, I want to make sure we focus on the idea that school is a center of community, and it's a community for everybody, young and old alike. And I think that's an important it's an important part. And I think. You're hitting it right on when you talk and about the, it. And I do. We need that group. And I know when I, as a teacher that went into a brand new school yeah, and, and then even retired from that school, but knowing that they there was that projection in 10 years that, oh, we're going to get new carpet. We're going to get new paint. We're going to get all of these upgrades. And then that hit the... 2006, and all of a sudden we're going, what happened? Because we're not getting any of that. And I know two years ago when I was with Rich driving around on the first day of school, and I, we were not in the car five seconds, and he gets a, an emergency call. So he's driving in on an emergency call. <laughs> Just knowing that, um, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer is what is kind of scary to me. And you want to just kind of shake some of the people in our community and say, I know, I, I, because I know how expensive things are. I mean, I know the cost of a roof on a house today is unbelievable. It just keeps escalating. Nothing is going down. There are no breaks anymore. So, If I could let um, Assistant Superintendent Windsor ch chime in real quick. Well, I appreciate all the comments, and, and I, I th think you'll feel the passion. I, and I'm going to, one, I want to give huge kudos to our principals and how they've navigated this conversation. I will tell you from starting the day before winter break ended for five and a half weeks straight, there's been a phone call about potentially not opening a school every single day. I mean, it literally and, and, wants and, you to be and in tears. Let me just, and let me just give context to it. We have principals that are spending... How many hours are we texting on the phone, trying to maintain buildings staying open with not trying to create any panic in any of our teachers, any of our community? But I, it's, not just, it's not just trying to make that for exaggeration, but I'm taking away instructional leaders, people who are connecting with students each and every day to manage buildings. That is not what Greg would like to do, is he would like to be connecting with his students, his teachers, oh, being in classrooms. Retirement, know, retirement we're not going to talk about, Greg. Um, <laughs> But I think the part that it's not only not only as far as these details here, it's the time and the cost that we're taking away people to help educate our students. 
and about making connections with students. It's about connecting adults with students and knowing that trusted adults need to be connected with our students. If you had to try to put a cost on that, we couldn't. We've talked about how important that aspect is. And so the reality for us is we talk about trying to make a correlation between you know, bond work and the connection what's best for kids. I can't take away time and energy away from our trusted adults in our buildings to try to manage boilers rather than trying to educate and build relationships with students. Director Moore. Uh, Superintendent Kane, the back to the twenty million dollars that you're asking for out of fund balance that we'll talk about February twenty seventh. How much of well, how much is available in fund balance in whole, and how what of what percentage are we talking about needing to use for this? Yeah, we'll still have about fifty million left in fund balance, unassigned fund balance left to utilize in the future. Okay. That answer your question. So, so we're talking about 25, 30 percent. Mm -hmm. Yes. F just for one, one year's year. worth of issues. Year. Okay, thank you. For one year's worth of things that are on fire. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Director Thompson. Yeah, because the backlog you guys said was seventy million. Correct. So. Um, uh, I appreciated the slide with all the options. Um, I think that that really highlights how practical and reasonable the bond ask is um, to address these concerns. So I did appreciate the slide a lot. Um, so I, I just wanted to point that out and that it, it does feel like the decisions that have been made the last two years about putting it on the ballot was really a responsible um, decision of the board because it's this is highly needed. Um, this is a reasonable uh, solution that doesn't increase taxes. Um, it's going to keep things flat. Um, and then, of course, the voters get to decide how they want to how, how they want to vote for it. But it shows that the board did their due diligence the last two times. So, if I could add to that, President Williams, um, it costs somewhere around three hundred and eighty-six thousand and change to run an election in 2024. If you throw in another 50 plus thousand, maybe 100,000 for all the polling and, and everything that we would need in order to provide all the information for the Board of Education to make an intelligent decision. So let's just say worst case scenario, you're talking about $450,000 to um, do everything necessary to run an election. And that is truly worst case scenario. One year is $125 million more that our taxpayers will have to spend because they, we will have to replace these things eventually, one way or another. We can't just not. Like the plan can't just be that Chaparral High School closes down and we just call it a day. Um, we will eventually fix these things. And it costs our taxpayers $125 million every year that goes by. And there is a lot of that money where there is no return at all. We are just, it's sunk costs where we are just lighting money on fire because we are not able to invest in the maintenance of our buildings, um, like the $2 million a year to maintain old buses. If we had new buses, that $2 million a year would not be spent. We're not getting anything out of that $2 million a year except that we're keeping, we're keeping them running. Um, and so there are a lot of those costs that are truly sunk costs where the taxpayers aren't making an investment. It's actually just a sunk cost. Director Myers. So I'm glad uh, Director Moore asked that question about the fund balance. And so there's always rumors that are always floating around. Is there a maximum that we can have in the, our fund ba balance? And is there a minimum that we can't go below in our fund balance? There is not a, well, actually there kind of is a maximum. The state of Colorado would like you to stay at 15% or so, lower than 15% of expenses, but they don't really enforce that too much. Uh, it's not a problem though, because we're, <laughs> we're gonna have to spend fund balance on, on um, these operational things. In terms of the minimum, Tabor, I'm actually gonna let, uh, CFO Schleisner answer that because I'm going to do it wrong. <laughs> we do have to keep Tabor, which is around 17 million, 
And we have a board policy to keep board contingency, which you all can decide how to spend that, of $17 million, so that matches our TABOR. And then we have various other assignments on our fund balance, and then we have this unassigned, and that's kind of where we're talking is this unassigned fund balance. So we look at that for, like when we issue bonds, our um, Moody's looks at that and gives us our credit rating. It's a piece of it. What that right number is when they start to downgrade us is, is kind of that question. But we are, we're pretty high because we've been accumulating um, some of that additional fund balance with the vacancies that we've had before we passed 5A. So hopefully 5A will help us fill, and it is showing to help us fill some of those vacancies. But that's contributed to some of that fund balance, which gives us some of that one-time capacity. So there's not a maximum or a minimum, but there's a sweet spot to, to be to help us with the credit ratings and to, to provide some flexibility as we go forward with some of these issues. Thank you. And I would add that our unassigned fund balance, as you just heard, buys us about two and a half years. Um, and the longer we wait on the rest of the $70 million backlog, the more things will be on fire. So next year, it won't be a $20 million cost. For the things that will be on fire, it's going to be a $30 million cost. So really, the, fund balance, the unassigned fund balance, if you consider it that way, more or less buys us two years. Yeah, and um, thank you for the presentation. It was really helpful. I think um, it really just showed us how much trouble we're actually in. I think for me personally, um, for 5B, is more going to be about the polling. Um, and my decision personally will come down to what are we going to do differently? Because we have asked the community two times for the same thing, and we've gotten the same result twice. So what is it going to look like? this year that perhaps might be different than what it has been the last two years. If I may um, sure. add a comment to that. Um, you're right, we need to see the polling too. Um, and I think in 2024, 5B being completely separate and not having a 5A on top of it will be helpful. As Director Meek pointed out, this presentation is really very much around 5B specifically whereas before it was kind of everything put together. Um, I would say that, number one. And number two is a request. If the Board of Education would like um, a member or a couple of members to review polling questions um, before they, get, they go out, we, we definitely need to know that. Well, tonight would be good. Um, yeah, so we definitely need to know that soon. Thank you. Would you like me to make a motion, or should we just agree that, I mean? So I don't think we can do a motion because it's um, a work session, but I think we can talk about it. And if there's a couple members who want to um, step forward to do that, I think it would be helpful. Um, so is there anyone who would like to volunteer to do that? I'd be happy to volunteer. Um, I, do you want to do it? OK. Director Moore and Director Meek will. That would be really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I probably ran over on this one too, but Great. thank you very much. Great. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to move on to number 10, uh, the proposed revisions to JIH student interviews, searches, and arrests. First reading, five-minute overview, and a 10-minute Q&A. Good evening, Board of Directors. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here this evening to go through some revisions to um, policy JIH that we're proposing. Uh, so over the course of the last year, we have really gone through a process of research, et cetera, to uh, look more closely at our search policy and some uh, revisions that need to play, take place um, in that policy. This policy is centered around maintaining a climate that is conducive to learning, and it is also protective of the safety and the welfare of our students and our staff. Um, so you're seeing the redlined version of the search policy up there. The previous search or our current search policy um, was last um, revised in 2002. 
And so this policy is definitely one that we acknowledge needs to be updated. I'd like to just highlight some of the critical components of this policy um, that has been updated. But first I'd like to thank our Director of Safety and Security, Mr. Johnny Grusing, who is here this evening, um, as well as our legal team, um, as we have really gone through a comprehensive process and research around this policy, the work of this policy in other districts, what this policy looks like in other districts, as well as CASB's model policy in this regard. So that has been a part of our comprehensive review that has gotten us to this particular place. Um, so as I said, based on, on our research of other districts, um, we are proposing essential updates to this policy. This is a much more robust and comprehensive policy than the one that we currently have. It has grown from a page and a half policy to a five page policy. Um, these updates in this policy are reflective of our obligations under the law, including case law, as well as legislative requirements. So the process of getting this proposed policy um, to you all this evening included bringing, drafting a proposed policy. We brought it to our district safety and security committee in January, and we went line by line with our legal team um, to review this policy with that comprehensive committee that we have in our district. So of course, our district safety and security committee exists of district staff, but it also includes all of our law enforcement partners in all of our different jurisdictions, as well as many other community members who have a vested interest in the safety and security of our district. So we went through, reviewed that, reviewed the proposed policy, offered up suggestions, and those suggestions are reflected in where we are right now with a, a proposed policy in front of you. Um, you will see in this policy that we have added key definitions that did not exist in the current policy, but key definitions definitely help um, for clarity in terms of the terminology that is used and the factors that are considered with our expectations per the policy. Um, the standard for schools is and, and, and remains reasonable grounds, reasonable suspicion. That has not changed from the previous policy, but that definition is clearly defined and present in this proposed policy. You will see in this proposed policy as well, it's probably better not to look at the red line version because there are so many revisions. Um, you will see in this proposed policy that we have also included information or expectation around student interviews as well as law enforcement involvement. Those are two critical additional elements um, that are embedded in this policy and that is pretty standard in the policies that we've reviewed from other districts as well. Those elements don't currently live in any other of our policies right now, so we didn't shift that from other policy. It just doesn't live in any policy, so we felt the need to add it to this particular policy. Um, in terms of the different um, sections of this policy, a few things I would highlight um, for all of you. Um, the interviews by school administrators, there's a section um, in the beginning of the policy that outlines expectations in that regard. And as I said before, it also includes the definition around what a student interview entails. And so that is a critical different. Um, the, reasonable the reasonable ground standard still does apply though. Um, in terms of the search of school property element of this policy, you will see that um, that element has been broadened to include search of school property beyond lockers in parking parking lot vehicles, but also including storage areas within schools that students may utilize 
and school-owned electronic devices. So that has been one element that's added. It has been cross-referenced with our superintendent file um, around electronics as well. Um, the person or personal effects element of the proposed policy um, has also been brought in to include the use of metal detecting wands and the requirement of training. That did not exist in our current policy, but is embedded in this policy. Currently, this has been uh, an enhancement to our search procedures this year. Currently, all of our secondary schools have metal detecting wands that are used for student searches when necessary. And we went through tr our safety and security team uh, and our law enforcement partners, Lieutenant Rotherham here with DCSO, we went through comprehensive training with our administrators on the use of wands for searches as well as um, quality search practices um, and expectations at the beginning of the year with all of our administrators. That was done collectively as a whole group of administrators as well as on site when we um, facilitated lockdown drills in our secondary schools. So we have amped and um, now have robust training around searches including the wand, use of wands. Um, you will also see in the proposed policy um, law enforcement involvement and arrests um, information. It clearly outlines that law enforcement officers are not subject to the direction or supervision of the school district. Our law enforcement partners are, um, are required to operate under their legal requirements under the law and criminal standards. So you will see that outlined as well within this policy. So that is a high level overview. Um, Mr. Grusing, um, as well as um, Ms. Klamesh, we are here to answer questions. Um, since this is a first reading, we are happy to answer those questions. In terms of next steps, I can just offer that now before we get into the Q&A component. Um, we will post this policy on the district website in the Board of Education proposed updated policy to allow our community to also provide feedback. Um, I did um, forget to mention that we also took this policy to school administrators um, in the last month for their feedback as well and have been responsive to some of that feedback. So that would be part of our next steps um, with the intention to bring back any revisions to this proposal um, at the February 27th Board of Education meeting. Any questions for Director Meek? Um, thank you, this was really helpful. Um, in regards to feedback, um, should we specifically ask DAC to weigh in on it and also the student advisory group? So in the update last night, I mentioned the policy, but I didn't really send it, I didn't have the link with me or anything. So I'm just curious, are we intentionally reaching out to um, the student advisory group, DAC, and then the equity advisory committee, and then also making sure that our charter schools have an opportunity to weigh in? I can take it. Yes, I think the best way to do that is with the community input form so we can make sure that the um, staff liaisons for each of those committees just ensures that that committee has um, access to that form and really calls it out so it doesn't get lost in their email and then that way they can um, weigh in via that form. Thank you for the suggestion. Director Thompson. I also was thinking DCCAC. Um, so we're thinking across as many student groups as possible. So we can just have the liaison, the staff liaison send it out, make sure that they know about it. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, so just a general question, it has changed substantially and a lot of time has passed. The very, the original first paragraph was struck 
Um, and the reason I'm asking about it, the statement where it talks about, it ends with may immediately take possession of any illegal, unauthorized, or contraband materials discovered in the search. So that language is part of the paragraph that was struck. We have a definition for contraband though, but we don't really mention contraband anywhere. And I, I was just curious if that was intentional um, it, to take that language out, but then keep or put in a definition for, for contraband. Thank you. Um, so my recollection, granted, I don't have the paragraphs memorized, but it, the policy, I believe, does speak around contraband um, within it. And so I just need a minute to and review that And you know what, this component. is a first reading. It was just something okay. that jumped out at me. Um, and I may have missed it, too, because it was kind of hard to track because it's substantially different. Um, so that's just something I'm throwing out there for now as a, a wondering. I, I also was curious about training, but you spoke to training, um, that all admin have gone through training. And that's probably something that's more in a regulation than in a policy. I, it was a curiosity of mine. Um, but that was really the, the main thing I just had a question on. Superintendent Kane. Um, with with respect to um, the contraband definition, because um, the red line is so hard to get through, um, I went to the clean version and did a search, and the word contraband is in there twice, uh, three times, once for the definition and two other times, but the red line is so hard to read. Thank you for finding that. Thank you for your question, Director Meek. The policy was also organized to assist our um, stakeholders and really understanding the policy as best as possible so that if a parent or a student or an administrator read it, when you look to the different sections, we tried to divide it out so they could see that, for example, if you're going to take property that might have been seized in a search, that's in an appropriate place rather than being at the very beginning or an introductory paragraph to the policy. So the intention was really to try to configure the policy so it would be as instructive as possible for somebody who was looking for something specific with respect to a particular search, interview, seizure, questioning of a student. And um, it's, it's quite possible that it could be refined further to make it even more instructive or bring more meaning to it for our stakeholders. And we'll see how that can be done after we get input from folks um, when, it, when it is posted for that kind of input. Director Thompson. Um, so I appreciate that you guys considered the readability of the document. Um, and that's a good yeah point for feedback. So if we are going to reach out to committees that, um, and even talking with the student groups, where do they have the questions at when it ends up not being clear? So that's really helpful. Do you mind just briefly outlining what changes in practice will occur if this, if it were to go, if we were to uh, like vote on this tonight as written? What are, you t mentioned training? Um, what other change in like practice? I can't think of anything substantially changing in terms of our practice. Um, one of the things, as I've already mentioned, you referenced the training element is critical around um, this policy. Um, we took it upon ourselves, knowing we needed to update and revise this policy. And while we were doing so, we needed to train. Um, our, our staff, our administrators specifically in regards to their obligations under the law. Um, and so I can't think of anything substantially shifting um, with practice, except that we are always very closely working with our administrators based on circumstances in our schools that involve students and our families to determine what we need to do to continue to enforce the, and support their learning. Um, and this is one example of that. I, I found this extremely helpful. Just as a parent, I, f I feel like it's pretty clean. And I love the definitions because I think 
we all have different perceptions about what certain things mean, and so to have it in the policy is super helpful. So thank you, Director Moore. <clears throat> yeah, having you know seen this tonight for the first time, I think it's very well done, and uh, it does seem like it's based on current practice and current acceptable standards and what's reasonable, what most people I think would find reasonable and they would expect. And in this uh, crazy world we live in today, the only question or just comment I have, and I'm not sure if I'm only gonna phrase it in the form of a question, but under the definition of reasonable suspicion, um, you talk about part of what makes up reasonable suspicion is information from a reasonable informant. And the only comment I'll make, and, and we can just go from there, is that some people might misinterpret <clears throat> what that means. And when they think of informant, they may just jump to a conclusion about things they see on TV and think law enforcement is instantly involved in something like that. I just wonder if what's the rationale for that term, reasonable informant, versus just reasonable information? Just food for thought, and it's, and it's not a deal breaker for me by any stretch. It's just a thought process. Yeah, th thank you very much for your comment, Director Moore. Um, informant, it, uh, what you're really suggesting is that it might bring additional meaning to the term when we're really just talking about information. Correct. However, in this case, I think we used the term informant because the information is coming from a person. It could be a student, it could be a parent. So it's not just information you might get from somebody else. And r really, when we look at those definitions, we really thought they would be helpful even as a piece of training, because typically you might see in um, a, across the country when you look at search policies or you aren't necessarily going to see as detailed a definition of what reasonable suspicion is. And so we tried to explain it as well as we could in a way that would be understandable to our parents, to our students, to our administrators, so that there was an understanding of what reasonable suspicion meant above and beyond just using the terminology. Yeah, fair enough, thank you. Mm -hmm. Director Meek. I definitely appreciate having this updated because it this is really important information. I think the question I have is probably for the superintendent. How do we track um, student interviews, searches, arrests, how is that data tracked across our system? So I can get us started with a response. So when it comes to student interviews, um, I believe you said student arrests and searches or arrests. Um, so when it comes to arrests, I'll start with that. Uh, we work very closely with our law enforcement partners and we do, we have a system uh, currently in place that tracks the arrest information because we are now obligated under law to report that information uh, to the state of, of Colorado or Colorado Department of Education. When it comes to incidents that involve um, search and or um, interviews, it depends on the circumstance that's at play and much of that information is within our data information system, which is Infinite Campus. I'll let Assistant Superintendent share anything further if he would like to in that regard. No, I think that was great clarity. I think as we talk about interviews, there's obviously documentation we have from students that we track and monitor, I think, on a paper level. But as I think Deputy Superintendent Hyatt mentioned, it's tracked through Infinite Campus as well. I, I think in past like decades ago, monitoring reports, I remember seeing arrests being reported, but I, I don't really, but because I think it is required to be reported to CDE. So you can kind of see district to district what that looks like. I just wasn't really sure about interviews and searches. And if, if it's something that we look at to ensure that it's being addressed equitably across our schools, um, I loved hearing about the training, right? Going into that as being really important, but I was just wondering from a system-wide basis, 
how we keep an eye on that. Yeah, we appreciate the question. We actually spend, uh, at the beginning of the year, each of our executive director of schools do an attendance discipline-based training where we actually walk through our specific process and the expectations. And so every, every administrator, assistant principal, dean, any uh, administrative assistant that helps and supports that as well, we have a consistency in how that is recorded in our system. And so as we tag that, we actually try to make sure on the front end that we have consistency no matter what the situation is, there's a clear process of making sure student voice and representation um, is accounted for in every scenario. So from interviews, we could be interviewing from a student ditching a class to theft to fill in the blank. And so each one of those is making sure that um, all, representation, all representation is being heard and that we're not making assumptions in the process. Thank you very much. All right, we will move on to President Reports, number 11. Um, the next regular scheduled Board of Education meeting is February 27th. Um, the Board Retreat is on Saturday, February 24th, all day at the Legacy Campus. Agenda planning for both of those meetings will be tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, I recently, in the last two weeks, went to LRPC. We received the same presentation that we got this evening. We also talked about capacity and got this little humdinger uh, that talks about all of the facility capacities. So if anybody wanted to look at that, was interested, it was quite fascinating to me. So um, the capacity, and then we also talked about the master capital plan and the timeline to get that up and going so that especially um, with a potential bond, just all of, uh, all of that needs to get put together. In addition, I went to, I had the pleasure of going to Rock Canyon for a Rock Canyon versus Castleview basketball game uh, this last week. And it was really fun to just watch the kids be really passionate about playing their sport. Um, but I also wanted to draw attention to our coaches because what I saw from, from the the bleachers was just coaches who are very, very passionate and you know get really involved in the game, but also super encouraging for students, especially after you know they miss a shot or whatever. But just really helping um, encourage students to do the things they love. So I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to coaches. So that is all I have, um, Director Weiniger. Um, yep, looking forward to the retreat on the twenty fourth. And um, what I've done since our last meeting is I attended Lone Tree's uh, State of the City um, by the mayor, and um, she called out Douglas County School District and talked about the new legacy campus in Lone Tree and um, how uh, they got a new SRO and showed a video of him, Officer Mark Payne, and um, just his connection with the students there. And it was really well done. Um, and I have FOC on Thursday, so I'll provide an update on that next time. I'll start on this end, Director Meek. Yeah, so we have the board retreat again coming up on February 24th. There's a board committee survey that is out. So we have 26 responses so far. I think we need to send a reminder out to each of our committees. Um, I'm not gonna call out on any committee in particular, but there's one that only has a couple of responses at this point. So I think reminding all of our committees that they have until Friday is important um, to weigh in. Um, recently, I attended the STEM Highlands Ranch School Robotics Club on a Saturday morning. It's amazing how many students were there and um, just the work that they do and the dedication they have. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of the sponsorships for robotics have been declining, and so they were really looking for ideas for finding sponsors. It's not a cheap, um, inexpensive hobby, 
And so um, they were talking about working with legislators at the Capitol to try to come up with potentially a funding stream. And I, I think they've been working with someone in El Paso. But I promised them I would talk with the foundation and you know spread the word. So if anyone wants to invest in our students and in the robotics um, club, please contact STEM Highlands Ranch School or myself. Um, I also last weekend attended the Great Wall Chinese Academy Lunar New Year celebration. Um, so this is a Chinese culture school that has been in our district almost 20 years. Um, they operate actually out of Highlands Ranch High School, I believe. Uh, the director there said, hey, I met you when we started and it's been almost 20 years ago and they are still running strong. And that celebration was just so amazing to see all of the student performances. So that was a lot of fun. Director Myers and I will be going to the Capitol on Thursday with six of our students from the student advisory group. And so um, stay tuned for more details on that. And I think that's about it for me. Director Thompson. All right, so I had the honor uh, last Saturday to attend the eighth annual Douglas County School District Middle School Honor Ensemble. <laughs> It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so there were two guest conductors. Uh, Craig Westwood uh, conducted the band. He's from Cherry Creek, if I remember correctly. And then Kurt Stroman conducted the orchestra. And he's from our district, retired. The performance was fantastic. Those students are amazing. The music selection was very interesting and lively. And it was an absolute pleasure to, to attend it. And I had an amazing seat just high enough, right in the middle. Uh, so it was a great experience, highlight of my week. Uh, and then on January 25th, I saw Superintendent Kane there at the Eagle Academy's art show opening at the Lone Tree Art Center. Um, and so just gonna shout that out again, that it's open through um, March 24th, I believe is what you stated. Uh, Mr. Ricks, their art teacher, it was really fun to listen to him and how enthusiastic he is about the art program, how enthusiastic he is about the students and uh, creative at trying to raise funds. He has an art display that uh, if it sells for the price listed would break a Guinness World Record. So it's a fortune cookie uh, uh, display. So, um, so throwing that out there, if anybody wants to help Eagle Academy break a uh, world record. <laughs> and then um, the art show itself, the, the students, you know, it's a lot of work to build the skills um, for the different art pieces. It, there is such an amazing variety. And along with each of their pieces of artwork, they did student bios and they talked about their experience with Eagle Academy or experience with the, um, the art class and how meaningful it was for them, how things have turned around for them, um, being students at Eagle Academy and really just kind of like finding their place um, and feeling like they're succeeding academically. It was, it was very eye-opening for me. It was very touching. I highly recommend going out to see it and the artworks for sale. So it's another way to raise funds for their art department. <coughs> Director Myers. Just a reminder for the Douglas County Youth Initiative, we want to get the applications in by March 29th. And as one of the liaisons, as the liaison on this group, this is a, quite an eye-opening experience to see these kids that have overcome odds that we just can't even hardly have, believe happen in Douglas County. And then we'll have a great award ceremony in April. Uh, direct, we haven't really assigned our committees yet, but Director Meek and I were at the last SAG meeting and she gave an excellent presentation to our kids regarding policy versus operational. And I think they were a little kind of a lot of information. It was a lot of information, but I think that what we're trying to really promote is making sure that their voice is heard, that and it's and it's done correctly so that when they come present for the, before the board, that they, they really are bringing us pertinent information with policy. So I think Director Meek is the correct person to really help, help guide these kids and get them focused on that. So, I mean, I know she's in it with me, so uh, this, is a, this is a good beginning for these kids. 
Go ahead, Director Meek. Yeah, I was remiss. Um, welcome to the board, Director Moore. And, um, you know, as President Williams said earlier, we're a board with really diverse views. And I think all of us are here for what's best for kids. And, you know, I think as long as we keep that as, you know, our guiding value, and I'm really pleased with how we've really dug in recently. And so I welcome you to the board. And I, I should have said that when I gave my report. So, Director Moore. Um, first of all, thank you for the kind words. And, you know, being my first meeting, I don't have anything to report on. But I will say that, you know, it is a, it means a lot to me to be able to contribute and serve with such strong board and such diverse people, but such strong backgrounds and good character people. Um, and really for what I think is one of the most exceptional causes that we could do when it comes to volunteer work, um, which is doing something for, you know, the livelihood and the success, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, of uh, children. And so I want to thank you guys for, you know, all the work you put into the process to find a director. Um, by the, I'll say by the grace of God, I, I made it here to serve beside you, and I'm very honored to do that. And I just appreciate the diverse uh, views on things, but the expertise you all bring. And I want to just tell the superintendent, you know, how much, um, you know, having lived in the county for, you know, three decades or more, um, raised my kids here. Uh, my kids are K through 12, you know, and one graduated college, which I'm surprised. She, she turned out to be really smart. <laughs> no, she, she knows I'm joking. Um, and my youngest is a, is a junior in, in college and she'll, she'll graduate and, and she's studying community planning and, and I'm proud of, I'm proud of both of my kids, but you guys gave them the foundation. And so I'm as equally as honored to, to, to serve on behalf of outstanding teachers and you as an outstanding, exceptional superintendent and for what you all do as a team to make this community better. And, and I think Douglas County has a way of doing things that rises above other communities, whether it's the passion or the hearts or the character of the people involved doing it. Douglas County has a reputation for just being better at the way it does things. And I like that. And I, I think that's all attributable to you. So thank you for allowing me to be here with you. Great, thank you. Okay, on to number 14, which is convening an executive session. Um, so we would adjourn from this, we would adjourn and move into a, uh, executive session. So the purpose, uh, convening an executive session is a closed session for discussing a personnel matter, specifically for the superintendent's February performance check-in in her contract, section 6.1. Uh, pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024F. So do I have a motion to adjourn and convene in executive session? Motion to move to executive session. And adjourn. And adjourn. And adjourn. Oh, that's okay. And adjourn. So you can go home. <laughs> Second. Motion by Myers, seconded by Meek. Roll call, Meek. Aye. Moore. Aye. Myers. Aye. Thompson. Aye. Williams, aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passed six to zero. The meeting is now over. <laughs>